Good evening, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. I am so hyped. I don't know if I've ever been this hyped for an interview before because we're entering our third season. And this is the debut episode, episode 51 with Jay Carrico. Jay has been with us uh, now a third time. And Carrico is an activist um, uh, based out of Cleveland, Tennessee. And um, if you follow the pod over the last year, I was going to say years, but that would just be an exaggeration. <laughs> but a year going strong easily with the pod um, on this third season. Uh, Carrico does a lot of activism. We're actually going to start the conversation to kind of recuperate and talk some about some of his recent activism and just, you know, anything else that may be developing. And then we're just going to continue um, into a bunch of different topics surrounding the issue of Marxism, um, different types of ideologies. Um, there's a lot of things that we're going to sort of unpack tonight. And um, this will be a dense conversation, but at the same time, I think it will be simplistic enough um, in certain aspects to where if we want to reach out to working people, we have to be able to speak the language of the working people. And I think Jay does a great job of that. And so I love having their perspective on the show. And I just want to say, Jay, welcome to the show again. And thanks for accepting that invitation. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here and uh, always love talking to you. Thank you so much. Yes, um, this pod has really uh, changed my life and um, I I've gained some friends through it. Um, a lot of communication avenues. It's not about the money at all. Um, and uh, people who know me know that that's the truth. I haven't gained, well, technically I've gained some money from it, not a lot, but um, that's not the end goal at all. The end goal is to spread information. I'm an educator by trade. And um, this is gonna be my way to sort of transition, um, bring academia into uh, mainstream, but not just academia, but real voices and sort of just like personal experiences that I think that are left behind in academia and the glass ceiling. And we have to be able to connect the mass groups of people um, because the way we're going right now is not gonna to continue to work out for us. And we have to be able to diffuse our messaging a lot quicker um, because um, time is not on our side um, presently. And I, get, I think you guys will understand what I mean by that uh, towards the end of the conversation, once you um, hear this conversation. I just want to give one advertisement before we start and say that we've reached 64 different countries. Uh, this is truly an international pod. We have about 38% of our listener and viewership base outside of the United States. And that was the whole point of the forum, um, is to get international voices, um, a diverse group of voicing. Um, and I want to make one um clarification before we start that uh, we talked a lot off the air, Jay and I, we've talked a lot off the air, we talk a lot off the air, um, messaging and phone and everything else. And Jay had referred to my pod as a leftist podcast. And, and that's totally fine. That is probably, if you were to categorize it, it would show up as a leftist podcast. But me personally, I don't identify this as a leftist podcast only because um, the outreach is really massive. And some of my audience isn't necessarily leftist at all in ideology, but people are learning. I'm reaching a lot of different people. I'm getting feedback from different types of people that say that they don't always agree with the stuff I say, but they're truly learning and they're taking notes and they like it that I'm not judgmental. And so I want people to take that messaging away that this is not to be a judgmental pod. This is not only for leftist people. This is for people who want to learn. And that's why I put the emphasis on free thought and people are learning and that's making me happy because that's what I want to do in an area like the South where we're located, Jay and I, and people have these misconceptions that people aren't listening, but they are listening. It's just, um, we have to give people a chance and we just can't assume that people have certain views and they're going to keep those views. People do have the ability to change. And so I want people in my audience to think, you know, twice before they consider, you know, just prejudgments on, different groups of people, because I've had to learn that too um, over the last um, set of years, especially with the political climate that we're in. But um, Jay, I don't know if you want to respond to that tirade I just gave or <laughs> or anything. And um, I just want to say welcome to the show again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think um, that uh, yeah. it's awesome that you have a space where folks can, uh, you know, who, where folks can listen to thoughts that they may not um, have heard before and that they can learn and uh, and be able to engage with um, new 
ways of thinking. Yes. Um, and the reason why I kind of brought that in, I'm not going to say that it wasn't 100% intentional, is because it is relevant to the conversation today. Um, we're going to talk a lot about Marxism and communism. We're going to talk about these different terminologies, kind of unpack those a little bit and get into um, what the end game is with um, the whole idea of Marxism, communism, and how that's important to us um, living in the United States and around the world. Um, how do we build um, from our past? How do we build on our present um, that leads to our future? And um, and some of the stuff is honestly concerning because um, we talked some about the Communist Party of USA um, on the phone a few weeks ago, and I have a lot of questions about that. But I guess my first question for you, Jay, would be, what is some of your current activism work that you're doing right now? And you said something about writing an article soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now, uh, I'm working with um, uh, a workers group um, around the country, um, just trying to get people connected to uh, local uh, unions, connecting people to uh, grassroots organizations, I work with uh, my local Sunrise Club. I work with the uh, IWW Freelance Journalists Union. Um, I've uh, worked with um, uh, a lot of groups relating to uh, prison outreach, which is the articles I'm writing about right now. Um, uh, prison abolition and, and uh, or, or uh, extreme reform, um, whatever you know you want to, uh, however phraseology you want to use. Um, uh, I've been involved in that kind of work for a long time uh, as when I was an anarchist, especially, you know, I was involved in prison abolition. Now, you know, of course, I, it's pretty much the same as if I think the rich people probably, some of them should be there. Um, and, uh, it's kind of a joke, but um, the, uh, the, uh, as of right now, um, I'm working on a couple of articles. One is about in, uh, directly related to Tennessee. One is about uh, the, conditions inside of the Bradley County Jail, the conditions inside of Silverdale, the conditions inside of McMinn County, and uh, taking stories uh, that we've uh, gotten from people um, with our, uh, with the bell phone we did, uh, and a podcast that we did back in the day, taking those and looking at uh, a settlement that, that it's, that's, that's currently being processed, um, that's, that's involved with uh, denied, denial of medical care, uh, that's gonna, that's going to be out in about a month and a, half, a month or so because we have to wait until that is finalized and everything so we can push the information forward. Um, and then the second article I'm working on is about uh, rent in Tennessee and how folks in uh, in uh, Tennessee uh, apparently formed a, basically a cabal sort of a, a, um, a cartel to keep rent prices at a certain level. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to be writing about that as well. You recently posted a speech. I think it was from maybe 2021, um, on the, I guess, right after the Floyd protest and Breonna Taylor, and you were giving a speech for like seven minutes and you were talking to, I think, um, about a lawsuit. Is that the same lawsuit in question? That is, the lawsuit's been going on for about five years now, yes. yes. Wow, okay. And has there been rewards actually given to the victims? Uh, there will be very soon in, based on the severity of their um, situation. Uh, and they're, they're, I believe that's going to be about $4 million. Okay. $50,000 for a nurse practitioner as well. And uh, intake nurses, an individual uh, oversight person who is uh, appointed by the prosecution. Based on that um, time frame, I guess, we'll just say um, that May 26th, I think, when the unfortunate event happened with George Floyd, the, the police brutality um, case, the murder of George Floyd. Up until this point now, what would you say, have you changed at all as far as um, ideology is concerned from that point in time until now as far as any sort of strategy? Um, and I, I know that may be a pretty broad question, maybe uh, slightly ambiguous, but I'm just curious, like, I know I've changed some from that particular point to now, but maybe not for the reasons that people think. Um, what about yourself? Oh, 100%. Um, uh, I mean, well, more like 90%, 90% or something, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, so in the sense that uh, back then, 
I feel like I was a little more idealistic in the sense that um, I had an idea of what uh, the future society, the revolution, all this stuff looked like in my head. And it wasn't based on any historical model. It was based on, I mean, maybe Catalonia, Rojava, Kurdistan, you know, Shabbos, but like, but like very, you know, not, it wasn't based, it was based mainly on like ideals, you know, and it wasn't based on the material reality of how to get there. And so I would engage in sporadic and spontaneous uh, protests and sometimes campaigns and sometimes things like that, you know, it was involved in a lot of organizational work and stuff. But um, I think that now I, in terms of strategy, um, I would say that uh, my strategy is not now much more focused on leverages of power uh, and that being, uh, and, and specifically the leverage that we have through labor and the withholding mm-hmm. there. Yes. Um, I think I've changed um, in the sense that if anything, I've kind of gone away from the labels. Like I know labels are important, but um, particularly the labels of left and right, like I've really tried to um, get away from that because honestly, I have to tell you, and you may be able to help me with this and the listeners and just people down the road. I don't even know what the left means in the United States anymore. Um, Because I know that left in other places is a completely different semblance of what I think it's supposed to mean. Um, You talked about unions earlier. Um, One of the concerns I have is um, this attachment with unions to one of the corporate parties. is that feasible to continue this link with unions with the Democratic Party, which is one part of the ruling class? Can we just keep doing this when we've seen that the Democratic Party's track record um, has fell apart? When there was a time, and I talked to Norman Finkelstein about this, about how the Democratic Party was more of a labor party, um, especially in his heyday in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and even towards the 80s, I guess, um, before Reagan got in. And um, now I think there's almost a disassociation between, um, I guess, like the crux of what the purpose of a union was. And Democrats are almost just capitalizing off of that nostalgia when unions were, um, they had a different representation. Um, What do you think about that? Like, what's your view about this link with this um, this political, I guess, maneuvering of the Democrats that's associated with the unions that you mentioned before. Yeah, I think I think we 100% have to stop looking at what the Democrats say and start looking at what they do. And if you look at what they do, there's nothing that they're offering um, that's substantial uh, that we that, that really is going to change the circumstances in the way that we need to change them. And uh, I really am strongly supporting Sean Fain, um, who is the UAW um, uh, lab- uh, union uh, leader and uh, recently elected. And he has said we're, they're not going to, they, they, they have decided not to uh, uh, immediately support, at the very least, uh, Biden as a presidential candidate. And then that's a good stance to take, um, even though other unions have already um, you know, endorsed him at this stage a year and a half out. Um, I think that there is, you know, I try to think that people do things because they think it's the practical thing to do. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're doing the thing that they they think they need to do, fully aware of the limitations that are placed upon them oftentimes. Um, I hope to think that, you know, I like to, I like to start from that thought until I see evidence of corruption, you know what I mean? Uh, from people involved in, 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 in movements and things. Um, so so, so my, my, my immediate hopes and, and thoughts are that People saw, thought that they were going to find a weak spot, and they ended up hitting a, a wall, right? And and they, and and a lot of times, right? That they they thought they were manipulating the system, but the system was manipulating them, you know. And and I think that that's I think that that's a hard thing because when you when you engage with a group or engage with the the, the people, the people, you know, you don't want to have defeatism, right? And sometimes our critique of the system, if not met with a solution that's actionable, comes off as just pure cynicism, right? And and, and almost defeatism. 
And, and, and it comes from a place inside of us of revolutionary inspiration. You know, we want to see it work. We want to see it happen. We want to see the things happen. We know that waste more food than the rest of the world can eat. We know it's right there. Why can't we just organize people to go and deliver it? You know, like we, we know, you know what I'm saying? Like we know that there's these things and they're this close, you know, they're, they're this close to happening. It just takes a mind change. But then the fear cycle starts, right? The, the Democrats start saying, if you don't vote for us, then the worst things, your nightmares are going to come true. They don't have to offer you anything if they just make you scared. You know what I mean? If they just make you afraid and they act like they own your vote, they act like they own it, if they don't have to earn it, you know, and that's just like Joe Biden literally said, if you don't vote for me, you're not black. That's, that's, that should be the statement underneath the Democratic Party. They should just say that, you know what I mean? Like, they should, like, they, I mean, I mean, that, like, like that's the most honest thing, like, like, and I hate to say that, like, I, that, 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 I mean, like, what I mean is that his, he thinks, he really believes that he doesn't owe anything to the people, you know, that, 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 that he, and so I think that we, there's a lot of people, 50% of people don't want for, for Biden running, 50% of Democrats, that's a huge number of people, that's more than the number of people he beat Bernie by, you know, and the, you know what I'm saying, like, so, if we take that number and we take the number of people who would have voted for Bernie, maybe instead of Trump, and we take uh, maybe, so hypothetically, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if Bernie had, had made it in, uh, we can say 10% of Bernie's voters, one in 10 people who voted for Trump would have voted for Bernie. Uh, so we can look at these numbers and then we we actually have the, there's an opportunity right now for a third party candidate and, and, and to actually do something if they have the capacity, you know, to get the, the numbers on the thing. Now, will they actually be able to achieve that without some sort of, you know, uh, rigging basically, essentially, like they do with Bernie and, and Ron Paul. Um, no, but 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 you know, but at the same time, it, it can galvanize a bunch of people. It can it can help develop that switchboard for the revolution that we need. Um, that doesn't that doesn't require us reinventing the wheel, but just finding organizations already almost there. And so, uh, you know, if, if there's an organization that you that's local to you. And they may not have the same ideology as you, or they may not have the exact same tactics as you. And you may have been more experienced than them, and you've seen that that thing's not going to work. Stay with them for a season, right? Stay with them for a while until they realize that their thing's not going to work. You, they find themselves in defeatism, and then you go to them and say, hey, I've been there, man. This is this, this might work instead. That's the place to be, because, and then you can be there for them. But if you go in paternalistically being like, I know what's right, what? Then they're, that's just not going to psychologically work, even if you do, you know? Mm hmm. You mentioned you mentioned Bernie Sanders. And to me, this is a problematic figure um, in himself. Mm -hmm. um, I, at one point, I was on the Bernie train, but I got off of it pretty quickly. Um, the first time I really felt bad for him, I did. But I started to realize after um, after he had to drop out again, you know, he he at one point the first three states the second time around in 2020. And and then I don't know if it's a contract he signed with the DNC, the Democratic National Com Committee, which it probably is. I mean, even though he's an independent in the Senate, which is something that's just ridiculous to me. I mean, he's an independent technically, but he caucuses and works with the ruling class, even though he's an independent. Um, yeah. And so at and it almost leads me to believe that he was never, and maybe it's just something that's hindsight. It makes me almost just believe that was he ever in it to to start a revolution in the first place? Because um, just giving in so easily. I mean, he's already endorsed Biden again. Even the people that you associate with and talk to, because um, I know we've talked off camera, and you have um, a connection with the Midwestern Marx people. Um, with Eddie and um, Carlos, those guys. But um, it seems like everyone has a link with Bernie Sanders, some kind of way in shape or form um, that's on this so-called left in the United States. Um, and to me, it kind of sucks up the revolutionary potential. I don't know how you feel about that, but to me, it's concerning that everything goes back to one source. Um, the unions, all this stuff, is we're basically at the mercy of Democrats changing their minds. And are they going to ever leave the Democratic Party? Are these people ever going to leave the Bernie Sanders movement? Um, and then you just have a bunch of separation going on now. You know, you have people in their own camps. You have people who are like, 
fuck it, I'm never going to support a Democrat again. I'm going to be my own entity now. Um, what do you feel about that? Just like the, the potential of revolution, just like dying because of that disillusion from the Bernie Sanders movement. So I think, I think, uh, uh, I'll go, okay, I, I think I have three thoughts on this. Uh, the first to be on the fact, so I think that the, the Bernie, uh, in terms of his, uh, his, his, his capitulation to the Democratic Party, right? I, I, it's, 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 it's shameful and it sucks, you know? Um, do I think that that was his intention from the beginning? No, I think that, I think that, that he didn't want to be a pariah. His popular thought, his popular speak that Ralph Nader was a pariah to the Democratic Party, that it cost an election to the Democrats. Right, which is not true. The Democrats lost an election by not putting up a Bible candy, um, and that's that's the reality. If they if they would have offered something that 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 that, that, that Ralph Nader, Nader would have been offering, those people wouldn't have voted for Ralph Nader. And the thing is, most people who voted for Jill Stein, Bernie Sanders, or Ross Pro, whoever, weren't going to vote for that other person anyway. They just weren't going to vote, you know. And uh, and they might have voted for another third party. And and they don't take these things into consideration. When they, when they spin their narrative, you know? And so if Bernie's surrounding himself with people who don't think like that, and that anybody who does anything like that is the enemy, I can see just from peer pressure alone, you know what I mean? Uh, of that climate that he's in, you know, being something that is going to be, he's gonna, like I was saying earlier, he, he may have thought that he found a weak spot. He may have thought that he found some sort of thing. And then, but I think that what we got to do from here is the second point is that it's, it's, it's you know, these movements, sporadic, spontaneous uh, things like this, uh, actions, stuff, this comes along all the time. You know what I mean? It comes along and it leaves and it comes along and it leaves. We have to build something that stays, you know, past that, you know. And um, these, but these moments are opportunities to galvanize people, to get people to um, engage where the people are at. And we can't really determine, we can't really tell people where to go. We just got to be where they are, you know. And so any, any movement, whether it be Bernie or whatever, you know, we, we got to be there not to be saying we 100% believe this person's going to do anything because we know it's not going to be that. We know the machinations of revolution don't work like that. But we can be there to say this is how the machinations of revolution have worked before. You know, and and, 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 and so that's 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 what I would say uh, as far as that. And then uh, in terms of uh, will the Democrats ever change their mind in any sort of considerable way? not without leverage, you know, not without leverage being pushed extremely hard on corporations to fund them. Uh, we need corporate and corporate lobbyists. I mean, there's, we need a lot more than that, but that's the start, you know, where things can start to change in any sort of way. And if we don't have that, then the only solution is revolution. And, 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 and people, we don't, and people don't really, we're not ready for that. And, 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 and I mean, we may have to have that regardless, but we gotta get ready for it. If that's, if we don't think we can incorporate lobbyism, through some form of combining demonstration movements with uh, labor movements. So the labor movement can make, have a strike. The, the, the demonstration movement can make demands. There can be plausible deniability between the two, but they can be syncopated in engagement in, in a way that can bypass the Taft-Hartley law, which makes it to where unions cannot strike for public demand, but political demand. But that, they can withhold our, they can take our surplus labor value which isn't written, you know, 25% surplus labor values extracted, you know, whatever, which is way more than that, by the way, um, and the, the, from, from the, from the portion that they can then take and, 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 you know, you don't see it on their jacket that Raytheon is, you know, uh, you know, sponsoring this guy or whatever, but this is, but this is, um, this is the situation. Even Gary Johnson talked about that back in the day, right? And so, um, or Jill Stein talked about it too. And I think that, that, that this is, this is the, they can use our surplus labor value to influence politicians. We can't withhold our surplus labor value to, um, to and this is how power works. And, and we can understand, I think that we're close because we can understand it when it comes to gender dynamics more so more than ever. You know what I mean? You know, if somebody doesn't say yes, then it's not yes, right? You know, and so, and, and this, is, this, is, this is where it becomes this like, we have to see that our power is being taken every single day on it. On a daily basis, our earth's being destroyed. We have to see these things, and it's hard for working class people, I think, oftentimes to see it uh, in terms of environmental damage because they're so busy every single day just trying to survive. That, that, that and, and and that's why it doesn't pull. I don't think as high in the issues, you know. Um, but the, but we are approaching a time of environmental collapse, you know, and, and potential 
you know, um, catastrophic events, potential nuclear war, you know, the, the, the one, you know, if Republicans win potential civil war, you know, it's, 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 it's a, uh, it's, it's a dark time and we have to be ready, you know, and, and, and we have to be as organized as they are to be ready. And, and all the solidarity networks, all the mutual aid networks, once, if they, if they're connected, they can do the thing to support the strikes. They can do, they can become, so to speak, as the situation evolves. Um, the, 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 the Antifa can become the, the people who are, you know, secure the strikes. They can become the, you know, it, it, whatever skill they had before they were using in whatever demonstration they were doing before, um, they can now use that for something that is going to change the circumstance to where they don't have to, um, we don't have to have mutual aid because our because food is already available freely, you know? We don't have to have Antifa because Nazis, nobody, everybody, I mean, we'll have Antifa, but everybody will be Antifa, you know what I'm saying? And uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, it, it, you'll have a community wouldn't let that happen. They'd just be like, nope, if you I mean, if somebody, if, if somebody in Germany starts sig heiling, they're taking off, you know what I mean? Like, hey, you gotta stop that. You know, if they start putting up a, you know, because it's, it's about extermination of people, it's calling for murder. You can't just say, hey, we should murder all these people. You can't just start saying that in a room but that's what it is when you hold up a Nazi flag, you know? That's what it is. And uh, some people want to say that's the same as communism, which has happened since the 1930s, but, you know, that it's somehow the same. But it's, you know, that, you know, I think that's not, that's not really, you know, they're kind of to a certain extent, but I, I hate horseshoe theory also. <laughs> um, but sorry, that's it. Yeah, that's. No, you're fine. Um, it's actually perfect because I was going to talk some about. Um, getting um, this clarity when it comes to the terminologies before we talk some later about um, we will talk some about electoral politics but we will do like a mix and match i guess sort of speak um because i do have quite a few questions concerning the overlap of the two and how that's even possible um considering the the chaotic nature of the cycles i mean we're in another election cycle it seems like we're constantly in a battle of um and that's the problem that the forum has just for categories is just um, the binary nature of, um, I don't know if it's just a U.S. mindset or just a world mindset, but I've always, um, especially being um, a Ph.D., you know, a professor, avoiding um, binaries, avoiding thinking that there's always depth and layers to situations and to different lexicons and semantics, terminologies. I don't think that the general public considers that. Um, I think if, if if the general public consider the density of um, our culture of the world, we wouldn't have celeb culture so strong the way it is. And maybe celeb culture here in this country is so strong because of the powerful um, nature of capitalism. Um, it, it's, to me, it's absolutely ridiculous that musicians have this much control over the messaging. Um, that the ruling class put these same assholes in charge and they could be graded um, whatever they do, whatever talent they have, but how did these people get so powerful to where we've taken political advice from them? I mean, you have Greta Thunbergs, they blow out of nowhere. You have LeBron James, what, whatever way you want to think about them, Taylor Swift or whoever it is, is like, how did these people get so powerful to where, sure they're visible, but how do they have political clout? It's just, to me, that's absolutely ridiculous that we've reduced people to that sort of a, um, I guess they get they get that kind of a status because of just who they are, and and who gives them the tools or who says that they are the experts? Who says that they have this much knowledge to where you're struggling to pay for your food on the table, but yet you're going to listen to these assholes that are multimillionaires and billionaires? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I think that comes from what Lacan calls the lack of lack, right? Like um, <laughs> <laughs> they don't have the lack. They don't lack the thing. They they have perfect lives. I mean, like that's at least that's what we're you know taught to believe uh, if we watch the the spectacle. You know, um, I mean that's so. So if, if we is if we if, I think that that comes from. To be honest, uh, Judeo Christianity, to a certain extent, uh, a certain uh, I think a certain there's a certain um, deification uh, process that happens, um, and a certain martyrdom process also, and a certain uh, uh, there's, there's a certain um, 
doubt process. There's a skepticism. There's a, there's all these aspects that tie into it that are straight up uh, seem they come out of the same traditions. And I think mm. that's what what happens. Um, and then of course you know it's it, it's a good story that anybody if they practice long enough, they're skillful enough, they're talented enough. They could, that you could be that person. You right? could be that person. <laughs> you could be that person, yeah. And so uh, the more relatable they are, you know, the more, you know, the, and so they, that, that's, they pander, they pander to working class sentiments. They pander to, um, and, and even if they, even if they are that person, if they are, you know, genuine, you know, in some way or another, even if they are, um, they're still so removed from the reality of everyday people. And unless they like really like, like just like okay I, I guess to a certain extent counter Reeves maybe you can look at that like he really does and I can't speak to him like I've never met him or anything but he seems like he really does like go into the people you know what I mean and, and, and counter Reeves oh yeah yeah Keanu Reeves okay and, and I'm just saying this for example you know I'm sure there's other celebrities who've been like this you know what I'm saying uh, but like they, they really go to the people and they really try to be of the people even though they're a celebrity right like they go and, and hang out with uh, the homeless, the marginalized, not just in some sort of showy way, but like literally they just like go out and chill and like, and like meet people and like help people when they can do things when they can as much as they can, you know? Um, and I think there are, you know, so, so I'm not trying to say that just there, that there's not a reason to individually say this person is good or that this person is bad just because they're a celebrity, right? There's not some sort of innate goodness or badness in being known by people, you know what I mean? Like, you know, innately, you know, um, or, or even, or even in acquiring things per se, right? It's, it's you know, it's power, right? That we're, you know, we're talking about. And, and this is the reason why. So, in, in the Soviet Union, uh, celebrities oftentimes were not allowed to vote, um, if you, because you had right. the ability to fire so many that your vote was taken away. You know. Mm. Interesting. See, and this is as funny. Before I went on that um, conversation, I guess that inquiry within my mind it leads back to what I was going to ask you before you mentioned something earlier and we talked on a couple of episodes before you talk you refer to one particular space and moment um, you talk a lot about the Russian Revolution um, 1917 you talk a lot about the Soviet Union and um, to a smaller degree China's mentioned but at the end of the day, I guess the historical references, and I guess my the biggest issue I have, I don't identify as a Marxist. I never have. Um, I do, I guess, identify as a leftist. I have at times, and I would definitely be a part of the left. I am part of the left, but um, I feel like we have to be able to reach so many different types of people, as I mentioned earlier, and maybe that's just simply um, convincing people that in the moment, these tools can help you improve your situation that you're in. This is a necessary cause that we're fighting for. Um, how does a how does a distant land with different circumstances? How how pertinent is that to a 2023 situation in a Western mindset? And I guess my follow up question to that would be um, based on a statement that I was thinking about the other day which is capitalism is so bad that you can buy off a Western mindset. How much do you agree or disagree with that statement and um, addressing the first question as well? Hmm. I have to think about that statement for a second. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, yeah, that, uh, so the, the, the first question, let me go ahead and get with that, that one, because that one's, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, well, it's a good, it's a good comment. It's a, it's a, it's a packed statement. Um, it can mean a lot of things, uh, but to say so, what do I think that is relevant from the from the Soviet Union or uh, or the revolutions of the past today? Uh, I think that every if, if you get a chance to listen to the audio book of um, I believe it's uh, Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder uh, by Lenin, uh, the groups that they were existing with ideologically. Uh, within the left, within, within, well, you know, within the, the parties, the Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, these, these groups, you know, um, and even before, like, certainly their, their 
contrast, it's like 100% peasant nation, not industrialized, right? Um, certainly, you know, could not read mostly. Um, very high literacy rates, uh, way higher than. Um, but thought wise, there are a lot of the same currents. You have social democrats, you have, you know, th th there's, there's a lot of the same sort of engagements. And, and, and I think that that is, 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 part, is part of it, right? Like seeing where these same conversations have been happening for a hundred years shows that we're not that different, mm -hmm. you know? And that revolution is maybe not that far away. So that's one. Two, I would say that, uh, that um, when you've only been told one side of a story for so long, the other side, it, 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 that, that is important to understand because it, it is like the, the other, because it's not, because if you said, so for instance, if somebody said to me, that's all propaganda, it's like, well, I've only heard the other side, and that then, then it's not. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it can't be because the prop. I mean, it, it could be in the sense that it might not be. It, you know, propaganda is when you try to say something in a shorter way than you know. That with, with, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot more into it than you could possibly say, and you say it in a certain. So certainly in that way, but but what I mean is that if when you don't know about what happened and you don't know about any of the things that, that went on, you can't possibly learn from it in a way that's positive. You can't mm -hmm. possibly like engage with it from a place of material reality. You only engage with it from idealism, like purity fetish, which is what Carlos Grito talks about. You're only engaging with it from like, well, they did this thing I don't like, which like, like for instance, okay, I don't like that Lenin uh, uh, stopped the workers' councils, right? But does that mean then that if I was involved in a world war and I was thrust into a position where I was, you know, in some way, if one of us, if any of us were thrust into a position where they had some sort of level of power in a situation where there was 17 invasions, where all these things were happening, where all this stuff was, would, would, does, does that mean Lenin wanted to make that choice either? You know, or did he have to, did he, did the material situation rely on that thing to need to happen in that moment for things to, to be able to achieve industrialization. And then the second question is, we've already achieved industrialization. So will that even be a concern in our revolution, right? And so then when we look at those days, we can say, oh, well, that doesn't even relate to us, right? So it's not like, a, that's not a hard and fast rule that we need to uh, adhere to. Oh, you, you gotta do this exact thing that they did. You know, no, no, by no means. So I think differentiating from what is useful and what isn't, you know, from these things is, is certainly important. So that's, that's part two is that, is that you, we, we can learn from the mistakes, and but also not just say this failed because they brought literacy up. They were competing with the U.S. in terms of calorie intake. They were from a peasant nation, like ten years later, you know. And so, like that's 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 something that boom, you can't you can't take that away from anybody. And so, um, they also defeated the Nazis, you know. And so, I think th th this is you know how did that happen? Just seeing how similar. Uh, our situations were to their situation is 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 um, uncanny in a lot of regards. You'll read something and be like, "Did he write this because of this Facebook comment I just read?" You know what I mean? Like, um, and, and so <laughs> and so I think that's the and, and I think way I found a great hope, and I found I so see so many people who are just so disempowered. It's so the, 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 there's walls everywhere, and I found such great hope that other people elsewhere in the world were able to achieve such amazing things. And I find such sadness in that so many people who would, who would benefit from those changes, who would love to see that world, will not even look into it. And now that I have, I have all these comrades all over the world, the working class as a whole is my comrade. When you say left, not right, no, yeah, it's the working class, you know, it's, it's, it's and uh, versus the elite, you know? And so if, it opened up my whole way of engaging with people. You know, it made me go, okay, I don't, I'm not going to just like not engage this person because they said things I don't like. I'm going to try and see where they're coming from so I can materially, I can analyze what they care about and then materially show them how it has nothing to do with uh, the bigoted propaganda that they've been given, for instance. You know what I mean? 
it has nothing to do with that. You know, it, it has something to do with the way that the system um, is, you know, it's the material historical things that happen, the cause and effect science and there's a scientific worldview. That's, so that's the third day is a scientific worldview of the, and, and, and then the powerful engagements we've seen from this is, is a, both the historical analysis and the actual benefit, the material realities that have come from these things, I think are useful for anyone, regardless of their ideology to really see and say, oh, this was something that was worth something. So even if you come away thinking, well, I think that I would, rather, I would prefer a council communism than this other than Vanguard communism. Even if you come away with that, that's, that's fine. But you, 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 I, I would say that instead of saying that means Lenin wasn't really, he was just an opportunist or something like that. No, he, was, he really did mean it. He, you know what I mean? I really believe, and I really believe that people were really trying and they really were the best of hearts. And that comes back to today. When we're put in hard situations, our enemies are going to say really negative things about us. You know, I mean, they're going to say they're going to betray our intentions. They're going to make us look every single which way, you know, and if in a hundred years later, you know, we tried our best and we made some really powerful movements and we changed the world and, and changed the material circumstances for thousands of people, brought people out of poverty, brought people out into literacy, you know, and we were just forgotten as somebody who was just looking for power or power hungry. That's a trap. Okay. For, for some of my listeners that, and I don't want to assume things about the, the audience or the viewership and listenership. I know we have quite an audience, um, and I highlighted the statistics earlier about the outreach of Kiko's Freethinkers Forum. Um, and I will slip this in. Please encourage your interested friends and family to subscribe to our YouTube channel and um, your favorite podcasting platform. We're available everywhere. And I really do mean that because this is an education forum. It's really a public service. and and a lot of podcasts aren't talking about this type of stuff. Um, you will rarely hear me mention other channels. Um, I don't really care much about the rivalries between these different YouTube channels that get big. That's never going to happen on this forum. If, if we reach a million people, you're never going to hear me trashing talking about other YouTube channels because the emphasis is on us. Like we're trying to send messages and and build from the ground up, talk, you know, talk to actual people from different types of communities. Um, you never know who's going to be on here. And we're not into all this drama, the clickbait stuff. I'm sorry, this all of this is clickbait. And some of these people, they do have the same type of audience outreach that I do as far as the types of people who will listen to that type of messaging. But their interest to me are just like they're in for the money. And that's fine. Maybe they need the money to support their families and stuff. I'm not in a position to say that I don't need the money to support my family, but the same, I, I just, I believe principles have to mean something at some point. Otherwise YouTube is just going to be a propaganda tube in itself to where people are just trying to make money off of, um, everyone has their subscriber base and they're just trying to make money off of something and say whatever they need to say to get their audience up. And I'm just like, if the information is, is, connecting with the people let that be the reason that you get subscribers not because you hate this person or you don't like this motherfucker because you prefer this i, I just think that that's ridiculous what the, the whatever the left is supposed to be on youtube this this bread tube stuff is just um it's, it's just like the ben shapiro side of the conservatives i mean you have the conservatives doing the same thing um, with their channels, the Jordan Petersons, all these people, everyone knows who they are. And they all play this identity politics, culture war shit. And I'm just like, what Jay and I are talking about is class war. We're not talking about, and that's not to say that me being a black person isn't important in certain situations, or if you're part of the trans community or anything else. But we've been reduced to where it's like, if you're trans, you have to have these interests. If you're black, you have to vote for a certain person. If you're trans, you have to do. And I'm just like, we have to stop that stuff. We we need to get back to talking about material circumstances like Jay was talking about before, before we get into all this other stuff. And I really believe if we were in a better position um, mentally, we wouldn't even be having those types of issues. Like, I mean, we the system has to change, though. Um, for any of this identity politics to even change or to even matter, like the system has to change. It, 
a lot of this is contingent upon the system changing, and it it, it hasn't. So you can't build good meaning ideologies on bullshit. It's still going to be bullshit at the end of the day because the system is still corrupt, whether it's a good message or not, because the yeah. system is still based on capitalism. Very true. Very true. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, agree, I agree with you. On, I agree with you 100% that, that um, on, on just a couple of things there. Uh, one being that you, you said that, that, that the way that it's a lot of clickbait on the on the on on YouTube and on Facebook, a lot of drama uh, that, that they feel like that gives people eyeballs. Right. But you're not. But, but there's a responsibility for journalists to a certain extent. And if, and, and if you're on YouTube, no matter if you're a good journalist or not, you are a journalist in a way. If you're telling people things, if you're expressing new information, if you you are taking the role of a journalist, even if you don't see yourself as one. If you go and watch a video, you're doing the research. How different is that from reading something? Or if you talk to somebody who was firsthand had an engagement with something and you relay it to other people, you were doing the, the same uh, engagement as a journalist would. I mean, this is like a, you know, a tailor makes clothes, right? Uh, from linen and whatnot. But, but, but before that, people made clothes for themselves, right? You know what I'm saying? And in that moment, they were a tailor before the word tailor ever existed, the profession of tailor ever existed. You know, if you want to say it this way, right? And so we have to have a responsibility to, to, to holding up a certain level of, um, of, of the way we engage. And we, can, and we can look and say, yes, that will bring in eyeballs. And maybe you can kind of be in justify the means yourself and say, well, as long as we get the eyeballs, it doesn't matter. But you're teaching people to replicate your engagement. You know, you're teaching people to act like you, you know, and so that's how other people are going to act. That's what they're going to do to engage. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, you may not get the engagement that you would have gotten otherwise if you would, if you just don't, if you, if you don't do the thing. But guess what? If, if, if nobody else did it either, we'd all still be in this. We, we may not have as many views, but we'd have a better, healthier community. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And so, so in a healthier engagement, healthier dialogue. So I definitely hope that people take that, uh, you know, and take what you're saying and, and kind of and kind of like really hear that, you know. But sadly, I don't think people are going to hear that until they deal with the consequences that comes from that in terms of the unhealthy psychological aspects. They're going to come from creating drama between the working class, uh, the, the counterproductivity, um, even if, you know, even if it does never get to that level. Uh, and so secondarily. There, yeah, the, 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 there's not there's not any sort of systemic engagement. There's not any sort of systemic material, real change to the way that we engage with the thing. It, it won't it won't change, right? We re reproduce the system with our daily lives, you know. Um, and, and this is this is scary, but uh, but in a way, I find it a uh, promising, right? In that we have had, like with COVID, we we're talking about, we've had major changes to our lives. We've seen it. We've been told we're essential. We're starting to see labor start to do something. It's it's a hot labor summer or whatever, you know. And I think that when we when we uh, when we look at that, that we're, that we're having these kinds of, uh, it's becoming popular. It's becoming it's becoming to support labor. And if we look at the evolution of the social movements, some from Occupy, let's look at, let's go back to the, let's, uh, let's say, I think we should look at this from a, because there was a, there's definitely a distinctive break in, in um, when the COINTELPRO uh, just attack of the, of the Black Panthers to the, uh, to the WTO situation. Um, th 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 it seems as to me, just looking at historically, that while there was activism, a lot of activism in the 90s and 80s, um, that, uh, that larger scale demonstrations that, that were like the kind of the G20 and, the, and stuff like that, um, it was, there was just less during those times than there had been previously and that there were, you know, with Occupy, Black Lives Matter and, 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 and what we've seen uh, since. It, and, I'm not, and I think that'll be, a good, that'll be a good thing to analyze. I think it has to do with something to be, class i think it has to do with the cold war i think it has to do with um a lot of these things um but 
Uh, and people and people looking and going, huh, what is happening? Like, I don't know what to say. I don't know what's but right now, if we're looking at the evolutions that we've had since Occupy, you know, Occupy was like, well, we know that the banks control Washington and Wall Street, you know, controls everything. So, um, so let's kind of come to some sort of understanding of what that looks like and that, of, what, of, what, of what we want to see next, right? But we didn't make any demands. That was, that was a, but we didn't have any leverage. We didn't have any power. I mean, tents aren't the same as, you know, tanks, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so like, it's uh, you know, we, we were there, and that was good. No, I'm not saying it was anything, but it, but it was, but it was, but it was just the beginning of something. It was, you know, it was, it was, it was not the beginning, but the, the, but the, but in a way, for a lot of people, it was. You know what I mean? It was, it was like this kind of, the the framing of what the, ne the this next level of activism is going to, it, is going to be. You know, um, what we're going to be doing next, right? I mean, so we had this. And then now, now we can see this clearly that they've, they've outlawed camping, right? And it's about it's about homeless people, certainly. But it's also about that. They don't want another Occupy, right? They don't want another situation with other people because now people wouldn't just be like, oh, what are they doing over there? They'd be like, oh, yeah, I know what they're doing over there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, uh, and I think that if they had, and I think that, so, so I think that we're seeing an evolution towards, you know, that, a class expansionism, right? So people talk about class reductionism when you don't talk about certain certain issues, which I would, it's not, you should always talk about issues. If somebody's suffering, if you don't fucking see that the black freedom struggle in America has been the most revolutionary aspect of American politic, of the most successful revolutionary aspect of American politic, the most prominent aspect of American politic has done anything to change this damn country, then you are blind and you aren't revolutionary. You know, so, it, you know, that that is, I mean, we had the first, you know, you had the first, the, well, the first American revolution was, you know, a, a, a revolution national sovereignty saying that Britain shouldn't control this land. People who live on it should control this land. Um, that was a bourgeois revolution, certainly, but it was, it was, a, it was a revolution nonetheless. Now, the second revolution, of course, being the abolition, you know, the abolition revolution of the slaves uh, uh, standing up and, and freeing themselves with the help of the abolition movement, you know, and that was the second, you know. Is the Black Lives Revolution, and then we have the third Black Lives Revolution, which or the second Black Lives Revolution, the third American Revolution, that was the revolution of the uh, the of social revolution of Martin Luther King. And so this is this this is a um, we don't if we don't if we blind ourselves to that understanding of American history, we take the line of the five year trader war being what defines the South, right? We take that line, and of course in that situation, how can you have any sort of It, that is a story uh, that, that builds to what we have now. The second, the second engagement that's, that's supposed to the Cold War. You know, this, this, this new, this worker-centered, but also saying, you know, when George Floyd was killed, he's one of us. He's a worker. You know, he, he's he's one of us. He like he, he could be any of us. You know, he now he's black, and and the, and black people built this country, and of course they go after black people more because. They've always wanted to divide the working class. They've always wanted to keep black people down because they don't want because of racist notions back in the past, because of power now, you know, and because people people who've seen shit firsthand and have seen it for a long, a long, long time. Not some sort of sin in some sort of sensualist way by any means, but historically, you know, you would, you know, if, if people are given liberation at writ, at large, just just I mean, had, you know, you see major social changes happen really quick. You know, and they don't want that to happen on the larger scale. You know, they don't want that to happen on a larger scale. So they keep black people oppressed, uh, and native people oppressed, and, and other you know who, who've who've been systemically oppressed continuously, so that those stories are never told in the larger scale. Those those those, those ideas are never put. They can they they can be represented via 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 inclusion, but never via exposition. Mm, I got you. And and see, I had a question. I was going to talk about, and I, I promise, audience, we will get into the terminologies, but Jay brought something up then that was actually a question that I had. Um, Jay mentioned marginalizations, and this is something I've struggled with uh, um, some, too, um, this idea of marginalizations, because I know that it takes different forms. Um, 
I think there's a danger too um, when there's not a cont a contextual understanding. And Jay laid it out perfectly about the importance of revolutionary politics. And I've told people, um, I don't believe electoral politics is the answer. Me personally, um, I think it's a very if it is, it's a very 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 small part of the equation, unless you make it some sort of way revolutionary. And to me, the only way to be a revolutionary in voting, which to me in itself isn't revolutionary. I think if you're, if you belong to any of these groups that are so-called marginalized, um, you have to think outside of the DR alliance. Um, I've said that so many times on the forum. I think black politics personally should only be revolutionary in nature. So the black politics of revolutionary in nature, based on the history that's already been established, we can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. And so just and if that means like never supporting Democrats again, that's, that needs to be done. Um, that's the stance that I'm at at this point. And I think people who are playing along with this scam that things are going to change, you know, you know, supporting this candidate versus that one. I mean, I guess I guess if you have that mindset, maybe you've already just been convinced that this system is as good as it's going to get. And um, maybe you're not ready for a revolution. I don't know. And um, that's not to shame people, but it's just I just think that there's so many different mindsets at play. And um, people are confused. I think people are literally confused. They have concerns to be confused because they've gotten so many different types of messaging over the years and they don't know what to believe. Um, but to kind of get to the question I had about this issue, um, how do we define vulnerability and marginalization? Um, and how do we prioritize that within the class struggle? Because um, I don't hear white people mentioned so much within leftist circles. And I think that's a big difference semantically between the right and the left, the so-called right and the left, is that I think that people who are um, right people, <laughs> the right people, not white people, right people, <laughs> just like they're part of the song with Wild Cherry, play that funky music, white boy, people are like, are they saying right or white? But <laughs> we're talking about the political right here. Um, I can sort of see that line of thought that white people are left out because um, that would have to be part of the marginalization. We're talking about class marginalization. We can't just be talking about black people and everyone. We have to be talking about literally everybody. White people are the majority, so that would have to include white people if we're yeah. talking about marginalizations. But how do how do we define that when we say vulnerabilities, uh, marginalizations within this context? So I think uh, I think that's th that it's it's useful to understand, I guess, for folks who are for for folks who maybe not necessarily engaged with left wing thought, you know, very often or social justice thought or or et cetera, et cetera, to understand the whiteness did not even. Uh, that, that, that whiteness did not was did not look like it did the word whiteness the term whiteness in 1900 as it does today um, that 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 there that there is assimilation process that happens in order to be considered white and this happened to the Irish this happened to the Italians this happened to the Jewish people um, and to a certain extent which Jews Jewish people are still not necessarily uh, treated the same based on you know they're not considered white all the time and, and they're not treated the same even if they are I mean I wasn't when I was and I mean, sometimes people make fun of Irish people and stuff like that too, or Italian people in a certain way or something like that. But that's not exactly the same as like systemic, you know, injustice against, you know. Um, uh, and so when we're talking about that, when we look at racism and things like that, uh, uh, and, I, and I don't know, you know, this is more for people who maybe not be involved, you know, you know, I mean, I'm not talking, you know. So, but I think we're not, we're talking about systemic level, not necessarily like individual proclivity. Right. right. Um, my individual proclivity. This is the way I. So this is this is the way I've been thinking about. Because I was always taught, you know, there's these spaces where people can feel safe to not have bigoted notions within in these safe spaces. You know what I'm saying? Like places where people can organize uh, without having to deal with bigoted notions, right? And I do understand that. Like that, that makes that makes sense. And this is the way I've been thinking about it. Like, you don't stigmatize addiction, right? We don't. St we say the conditions that that occur that created addiction. It's like a disease, it's like a, not the fault of the individual who 
they, they didn't create that condition. They didn't create those situations. And maybe, maybe in some situations, you know what I mean? Um, that there, there are things, but a lot of times it's trauma and escape, right? But, you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a mechanism of trying to, you know, and so in the same way, it, but it can be harmful. It has real harmful effects, real harmful effects, both on themselves and on other people and on society. You know what I mean? And you can't distinguish these. You can't d- d- distinguish, distinguish these two. But you can say it's always the pharmaceutical company's fault for fentanyl, not gems. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and so like this, uh, and so this is, this is, um, so I think in the same way, if we want to have a working class revolution that doesn't make white people feel, white people feel like this working class movement doesn't, isn't about, it doesn't have anything to do with them or something of that nature. Like, you know what I'm saying, I guess. Um, which the people who feel like that, God. I know, I know. It doesn't have to be about you, you know what I'm saying? But like, anyway, uh, but, yeah. but. It is, it is though, it is though, because it, it doesn't have to be, and you should get over that, but it, but it is also, you know what I mean? So like, it, 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 psychologically, I get why people want something to have to be about them or whatever, but it is about working class people, right? It's about working class people who suffer under this situation. Now, some people are, suffer worse under this situation, but the solutions to the, 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 the issue is going to require all of us coming together and it's going to benefit everyone, you know, and, 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 and even reparations, for instance, if, if the reparations help an area that was hurt by slavery, guess what? Some white people live there now. Okay. So like, it's going to, you know, it's like, this is, this is like, we, 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 I think that there's a lot of things that people get. And this is why it's almost, I think, while a lot of people, if, if you're a right brain person and people have dismissed you before because you start saying these things, it's because, of course, we want to help all working class people. You know what I mean? Of course, we want all working class people to be risen up and stuff like that. But if you want to look at the most extreme examples of like the worst shit that America is doing, the worst shit that our police are doing, and the worst shit that's happening. You know what I mean? Why is it exponentially happening to people who, who, who are different color than you? You know what I'm saying? Like, why? You know what I mean? Like, why? And 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 it's and if you think that it's because people are more natural, like, you got to look back at like, okay, why is crime? Why does crime exist in general? Right? You're, people are not allowed into a system, right? They're 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 put they're made unemployed and they have to make food for their family. You know now. Here's the thing, though. Uh, wage theft is actually higher than bank robbery. So, the, I mean, you start there. First of all, we're actually talking about real crime. You know what I'm saying? There's way more white collar crime than there is crime of in the mm-hmm. But these situations exist because of because of poverty, because of uh, horrible situations, and, and and those kinds of things aren't going to be fixed unless there's the material capacity for people to be able to engage with. Uh, a society that meets their needs regardless of their productive capacity. Mm. But that, yeah. See, I made that, I made that comment because um, I'm not even going to, like I said, I will be going against my own principles if I outed like certain people. But um, I've been concerned lately, just like, for instance, um, like this whole idea of pan-Africanism, for instance, anytime something is so emphasized like that on a certain region and a certain group of people, um, that's pretty concerning considering that we have a world as big as we have. I mean, this is a massive world. And um, and I, I guess um, I'm pro-African-American reparations, for instance, but I can understand that there's a lot to dissect between that. I understand people who may, that may not have those views that are in line with mine or even yours. Um, that's more, that makes more sense to me because anytime something is associated with a certain group, I think that that causes a lot of angst and uncertainty and, and really just 
I guess people feel like, okay, how's that fair, you know? Because I guess the, the premise is like you're reversing a wrong, but at what cost, I guess, is what people are always thinking about. Um, but I think that's what it is. is it, it's almost a different type of, I won't call it identity politics, but it involves identities um, in a certain context. Um, not this whole circus of identity politics, because reparations to me is a legitimate issue, but it will become obsolete if people continue, I think, the path that they are, um, because I think anything that we're getting out of electoral politics isn't taking reparations seriously. And I think the more that we do that, it will make reparations less and less prioritized because you don't see people with actual plans of action um, in Washington, D.C. when you talk about reparations because it, it becomes an issue. Well, let's just keep pushing it down to the bottom of our priorities, which is like 5,000. And then a few years from now, when it's convenient, it goes back up to priority 50 out of 5,000. Right, and this is this is this is the sad reality that, that that the white voice should not even have a part in that conversation because it's something that was promised a long time ago and still hasn't been delivered. You know, and mm -hmm. and uh, I, and I will speak on this only to the point that I feel like I'm. You should listen to any black person on this who is who is a well versed. Other than, you know, rather than, but if this is the place where you're going to be hearing, you know, I, I, I do want to speak on it from what I've heard from other from black people that I. Sure, speak on it. you got to speak on it, but that's what I'm saying. Like, even that, like, we shouldn't have this, like, um, like, this is a free thought forum. Like, you don't have to give that reasoning because you're yeah. white, because, like, you're talking to me and you're talking to my audience. And I don't even care if audience members are uncomfortable with it, because for reparations to happen. It has to be because white people are part of it too. It can't just be, it's not something that black people have a decision over exclusively, yeah. even though it's- It would be awesome if they did though. <laughs> What's that? It would be awesome if y'all did though. Like, you know what I'm saying? If there was a mechanism <laughs> yeah, by which that would be able to happen. Like, yeah, that's true. Uh, black Reconstructionism, you know what I mean? was a dictatorship of the proletariat. You know, it was a, that, that was the first, that was one of the first examples of before even 1917, you know? And so uh, I think that that's um, uh, now okay yeah you're right and that, I think that's why people kind of do, to do kind of say I want to you know I, I think that's why some folks are like well we do need spaces that are literally where where people have power over these kinds of issues mm -hmm. that affect people exclusively you know and uh, and that that's uh, that, that makes total sense to me that makes total sense why people uh, want to you know this this isn't I think whenever some liberals will somewhat have like a boss or something equate black nationalism with white nationalism, that shit gets like, that's like, that's so annoying. And it's, it's, it's cause it's just, I mean, yes, some, some people may have some uh, reactionary uh, bigoted rhetoric, uh, but, but that's like, that's like, that's like way, way, way more prevalent on the white nationalism side than on black nationalism. Side. Can you, but, but before you get into what you were going to say, and I don't want to cut you off, but I want you to expand on that and say, where do you make that distinction when we talk about figures like Louis, like Louis Farrakhan, for instance? Like I, I follow people like that, and I don't agree with most of what they say, but I do agree with some of the tenets of what is being said because of a shared experience. Um, where do you make that distinction between the types of nationalism? Uh, so, so I think that there's a there's a oppressive form of nationalism wherein um, a group of people want everybody to assimilate to their um, thing and everybody else get out and some people get out anyway because you're not like us, right? I think the other thing is and that, and that, co that comes from a place of, uh, of you know, racism, bigotry, right? That comes from a place of wanting to oppress other people, wanting to conquer, wanting to colonize, wanting to um, you know, th these types of things. There's another that comes from a place of defense. When somebody has had um, their, their, their land stolen, their, their culture destroyed, their, um, their, their resources exploited um, for a long time by a group that wants nothing to, nothing but to, but to use them um, for at best entertainment, right? And like, and so, and, and, to, and, to, and to essentialize them into that and oftentimes, you know, into only music or only entertainment or whatever, you know? Um, 
uh, I, I think that when we look at Louis Farrakhan specifically, he's very important to the the, the, the black movement. You know, one hundred percent, definitely. That's him. undeniable. So for me to criticize, I mean, it's not my place. And and I, I mean, yeah, there's some things he says I don't agree with. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? There's things the W. E. D. Du Bois said that I don't agree with. You know what I mean? Um, but I think do I think that he was one of the leaders? Was he was he our Mao? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, that is our, I mean, like that is a working class hour, you know what I'm saying? And, and these, and it's, it's, it's a, uh, the, the, the black freedom struggle is where, how, where else in America am I going to get my revolutionary heroes, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm not just saying, I mean, obviously there's, you know, John Brown, you know what I'm saying? Obviously there's some, there's some great Jewish heroes and there's great uh, Hispanic heroes and there's great, but the black freedom struggle is the national struggle that existed in our society historically that had the most victories and revolutionary uh uh inspirational engagement you know what i mean it, it really and so it's not really it's not about essentialism or something of that nature by any means it's about where we can learn from what we can do next in the historical context of our country you know what i mean where we live you know and um and so of course with, with the, you know, the, the, you know, electoralism is never going to get the thing. And that's why I think a lot of folks kind of get into the whole, well, we got to deal with what we got. And, and it's mm. so sad because it's like, it's like, it's like the Democrats just move everything back. They, they, they take the left and they go, well, universal basic, uh, universal health care, impossible. Uh, um, Supreme Court expansion, impossible. Even things that, that are like not even radical, but are base points. Exactly. So, no, Essentially, moving everything to further in the other direction, you know, and uh, and so they, they stifle all social movements. They stifle justice, and that's and when you say, so when you said that about Bernie earlier, I do agree with you that the Democratic Party is a place where social justice ideas go to die, where they make them hokey, they d d deflate them of any meaning, they, they they rip them from the hands of people who could very well accomplish the goals if put in the positions, you know, and then they and then they. Sadly, and, and, and this is this is why you see black uh, mayors and, and, and political people voting for Cop City, right? Is mm -hmm. because they're not part of a black system that is for black people. They are part of a white system for white people, for rich white people, not for poor white people, you know? And, and if poor white people were running it, well, yeah, it probably would be more for poor white people. But it should be, you know, it should be poor everybody. You know, it should be working people running it, you know what I mean? Because they're not, they're not these... The the nine tenths of the this Lenin talks about this nine tenths of the, the media back then was run by the bourgeois. They have a dictatorship over everything. They run all of it. They get to say what happens. But in reality, naturally, we produce everything, right? So, so if we stop, our yes is actually or our no is actually the final no. Even if they're like, no matter what they say, you know what I'm saying? Now they can hire other people out from underneath us. That's why they want employment so high. You know, it's not to stop inflation. They love inflation. They want they want to create more artificial inflation so they can raise the prices, and make a buck. You know, they they've learned how to deal with capitalism not in a Keynesian way, which would be at least somewhat better. Not in, you know what I mean? It's not great, but it's, it's at least something compared to what we've got now, which is like finance capital, uh, late stage. You know, no uh, doubt. But you need capitalism. You need capitalism to get to socialism. I think that's an important part. It is an evolution. You have to have you have to have feudalism, capitalism, and then socialism. You, you can't just go from one to the other. It, it, it can't. Um, you, you have to have the. Uh, and now you can have a very regulated version of capitalism that, that happens in that period of time if you've already seized the state through workers and stuff like that. But there will still need to be um, that process. Uh, so I don't mean to say that there doesn't need to be in a, in a nation where, like, like for black folks who never, who never, who never actually had a capitalism for themselves, you know what I mean? That, that they exist on the Black Wall Street, you know what I mean? Like, it, which was burned down, you know what I'm saying? But they did, or for Native people, or for you know, for for most folks who weren't, who weren't given a, you know, then then, then there is a certain. This is where this is where it starts to get very very like, there is a very real need to look at the understanding of, because like if, if, if you're not even, if you're 600 times more likely to be not a home loan, that changes everything, you know? Like th there's just so much stuff that white people won't even see. But that being said, white working people suffer 
a lot too, a whole lot, you know? And so, and so to say that it's not, you know, to say that we, that we, we don't, we want to take away from white workers or something, somebody to know we want to, yeah, there might be five less billionaires and then, and everybody has enough. You go, know I'm saying like, you know, this, this is what I'm saying. It's not, none of the white people, no, no white workers were hurt in this process. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not about that. You know, it's about, it's about the target would be like some billionaires. Yes. there would be less billionaires probably that there'd be, and they probably would still be the richest people in the world, you know, but they would be, mm-hmm. they would be less, uh, they would have less power. They would have, and, and, you, and you as a white worker would actually have more power because black people have more power. That's, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's where, and this is where the historical analysis and the class analysis come back to what I say is class expansionism because you include race in the, in the historical analysis. So, so I kind of, we kind of touched on it earlier, but see, that's, that's kind of, and, and I don't want to, give the audience any impression and the audience probably has already picked up on this that it's called Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. I mean, I'm obviously Kiko and this is within uh, my mind and a lot of the episodes are um, involved with things that concern me at the time but I think they concern a lot of people and this is sort of like a safe space for issues that are not very complex to deal with and that's why you really have to have two to three hour conversations to kind of unpack them and get to, from point A to point B. You simply just can't look at a tweet that your favorite person says, and then you're like, oh gosh, I learned so much from that tweet. No, you actually have to listen to conversations, engage with people, and and work together to get through these tough contextual um, layers um, that we're talking about. But this system to me is very much, um, it's almost diminished the aspect of, I, just like me, for instance, like I said, I'm pro reparations, but now like I've talked to people and I may be finally actually able to get someone on about reparations to talk about reparations. Huh. After a year, what does that indicate? If I've tried to reach out to people for a year and consistently get rejected. And I've talked to my mom and dad about this, and they've asked me, son, um, have you tried to get black people on to talk about reparations? I'm saying to myself, are you fucking kidding me? Of course I have. But why is it that people won't come on the forum to talk about reparations? Well, I've gotten so many different types of people to talk about all different types of things. And you mean to tell me I can't get a person to come on to talk about reparations? And the one person that was prominent in the movement, I'm not going to mention their name, I've already outed them in an episode. So if you follow the forum, you know who I'm talking about. I mean, I lose respect for people who um, they're academics like I am, but, and they use reparations as their main topic. And you won't come onto a public service forum to, with another black person that's a PhD, mind you, to talk about reparations Mm -hmm. because I don't meet a precondition of selling books. I don't have a, a audience that's large enough to meet your 25 book quota to get on it. So to me, are we talking about, isn't black capitalism, white capitalism? Jared Ball came on the forum and we talked about this. Isn't black capitalism, white capitalism? Isn't capitalism still the same shit? So does it even matter if the black people are there, if they're buying into the system, how much did, does the marginalization even matter at that point, even if there was a such thing at, at a certain point? Because, I mean, you talk about black billionaires that are becoming more and more plentiful, um, black people who are becoming more and more um, in a class where they're able to afford all these different types of things. Like, where does that start to separate if you see more and more people just buying into capitalism? So I think that here, this is where it starts. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a, such a good question. I think that the, to the first part of the thing, I think that if, if there's not a, this, this is this actually really goes together very well. I think this is where theory actually is. It's just, just such a, this this is like such an awesome question because if there is no material leverage to get reparations, if the Democratic Party doesn't give a shit about mass incarceration or police brutality or reparations. And then, it, it, then 
where is the line on what even that looks like and how to achieve it? What, you know what I'm saying? Like you can't mutual aid, age way into rich people's pockets to get the money back. You know what I mean? This isn't, this isn't work. You know what I mean? Like you can't, I mean, you can ask them, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you can, but, but it's, 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 uh, and, and also, um, you know, th this is why, this is, this is the heart uh, to, to, to can, you, uh, can you reframe your second question again real quick, just so I can spit spurred or um, reset. Second question, I think was more so about, um, just black people buying into capitalism because oh. yeah and so 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 under a system in which uh okay so in a system under which the taxation of black capitalists still goes to the legislation of white elites right and not black working class people well then it's yes it's still you know, white capital, you know, it's still oppressor capitalism, right? You know, and I don't mean to say that there's a liberated liberation capitalism. What I'm trying to say is that under socialism, we would take the capitalists' money, uh, not through to, to build to build socialism. You know what I'm saying? Like we're we're gonna be building socialism. Right now we take the capitalist money to build at best a little bit of welfare capitalism. You know what I'm saying? And so so that's why there has to be this process of like uh, from the feudal to the capitalist to the. And so when I say black capitalism in this in this context here, I mean like black Wall Street sort of situation where there's four by. And yeah, everybody else can engage, you know what I mean? But it's but, but, the, but, the, but the, what's done with the money is determined by the, the community, you know what I mean? For the community so that that community can. Uh, develop socialism and we don't have to do I mean obviously it doesn't have to be done in some sort of way like that I'm, I'm just saying that that is why I think that that thought line exists under the under the because there's because we're all trying to do the thing we don't know how you know what I'm saying there's not a there's not an instruction manual you know what I'm saying but it seems as if 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 the capitalist system at writ, the at large one, the big C capitalist system, you know, the hegemony, the, hegemony, the, the imperialist system, you know what I mean? That is a lot different than a small, than, than, than a, a community that is developing um, out, out of poverty, you know what I'm saying, through through market mechanisms, right? Um, that's like a totally separate thing, right? Now, I still think that you want to have the workers run it, you know. And I still think you want to have the the uh, a, a situation where you have um, unions, you have uh, a Soviet model, uh, uh, meaning that you have local communities that have delegates that go up to a national assembly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I still think all those things. And I think that in reality, this is going to be a rainbow coalition, right? This is a rainbow coalition, right? But at the same time, for certain historical things that affect people, like immigration for uh, for people who are immigrants, you know, in general, or um, trans rights, gay rights, there do need to be um, uh, committees and subcommittees and, and things of that nature that allow for those specific issues that affect those specific people in the same way that you would have the Villa Drive um, uh, uh, Street Council well, because those people are affected by what's happening on Villa Drive. And if there's an earthquake on Villa Drive, you know, people who want to help and the people on Villa Drive would engage. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, so, and the people who are experts, right? And so you have all three of those people come together to engage. So in the same way, until there's a point where there isn't a material systemic difference anymore. You know what I mean? And once that's happened, well, then we don't need that sp the specific thing per se necessarily. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the, but, it, but, uh, but like... Um, any nation, uh, like for instance, there's 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 autonomous zones in almost in, in, under under so under socialist nations that that, that allow for uh, Muslim majorities to have Sharia law, for instance, or for uh, for indigenous people to maintain their culture. You know, and, and this is this is this is very this, this is this is where we don't you know to not you know make the superstructure oh oh force. The, the the smaller group to assimilate you know what i'm saying that's that's uh that's the the social side because that because sovereignty starts on the level of working the land right and and it has to otherwise you get into a little identity politics of of, of just representation through assimilation right and that's the difference between marxism and the tree thereof it's, which starts with national sovereignty 
and then goes into uh, expanding rights for everyone, but, but not by assimilating the culture, but by allowing the culture to be free, you know, not to be suppressed, you know? Okay, so that was a lot there. I like that part to where we segue, you talked about representation and assimilation, that's perfect. Because um, I want to ask a question that I've talked about earlier, like four times that this conversation is just so engaging. That's why I, I think you and I both kind of, we go out, we get in this zone and we just, it's hectic, but it makes sense to us. And I know it makes <laughs> sense to people in the audience, but it's just the way our brains are working because we got so much going on, the stimulation. But what is Marxism, just to get that kind of out of the way? Like, how do you define Marxism personally? And like, what exactly is that? Is that a stage of communism? Like, what is that when we say Marxism and communism? What is that? Okay, so Marxism, I would say, is the is the scientific understanding of how capital works, right? Of how and how society evolved, the cause and effect, the dialectic, the the what was the the seed being born, the the the, the, the changes, but has a seed inside of it at the beginning, right? So feudalism had capitalism inside of it, right? Mm -hmm. But then capitalism has socialism, and it, it becomes the next thing. You know, it plants a seed for the next. And Marxism, Marxism is just a study of that to go from these utopian ideas of what world would look like to a study of what the world is so that we can scientifically change it, right? Uh, it's, 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 if you want to say, compare it to another scientific thing, it would be uh, Darwinism, you know what I mean? It would be, it would be the theory of evolution. It would be, it's very similar. There's so much similarities mm -hmm. between the two, right? And so uh, socialism is the first form this takes where um, the bourgeois state that we currently live under, if you don't like the government right now, think about the fact that you've only ever lived under a bourgeois government. You've never lived, there's not something magical about government that makes it bad at doing things for you. You know what I mean? It's just an organizational model. It's just a thing that exists, you know? And so you got to get away from the magical thinking about that, first of all, because like, it's not, you only engage with corporate government. You know what I mean? Like if you live in the United States only, you know what I'm saying? And, it, and if you live outside the United States, you probably, and you live in a socialist nation, you've engaged with a socialist nation under great duress by the largest hegemon in the world because they spend, they spend $350 million, um, a million dollars a year on fighting unions. How much do you think they fought, uh, spent on fighting communism, you know, since the mm -hmm. beginning, you know, since the inception. So we're talking huge amounts of money. So, um, so, so if you, so if that's like, so that's, so socialism is the, the, the step in which the workers uh, at, at, at large realize, um, hey, wait a minute, we, we built this, everything you see, we built that, you know what I'm saying? And if we say no, then we can demand anything. The sky's the limit, you know? Now, so the, so the next step would be that we realize that and they say, we're going to crush this bourgeois state, meaning we're going to remove its uh, the capacity for the bourgeois to rule over the state. And that can take several forms, right? Um, but, but, you know, generally a mass uprising and a general strike. And oftentimes there's a violent reaction to that and that thus there has to be a defense of that revolution right and that defense of the revolution takes the form of a worker state in which the workers now suppress those who would fight the revolution meaning the former capitalists now not all former capitalists are going to have to fight because sometimes they're going to be like okay we're down to still basically be on the board of directors of this particular operation we're working on we're just not going to be making 300 times the amount of worth-paid employee anymore. We're still going to offer our insights and stuff like that. And, and, and we're not going to be, there's not taxes in the same way. I mean, there are sometimes usually at the beginning, mm. but eventually it's just production, you know, and then you, and then you, then there's, you know, you have certain quotas and if you make more than that. You the workers get paid more, you know, and people get paid more. Um, uh, and, 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 and that way, if somebody else produces less, well, yeah, there's still more of it because somebody else produced more, but you know, some it happens, you know what I'm saying? So some place might produce less, so it's really good for people to produce more, so let's incentivize that. And this can look very different in various different places, right? You know, you're gonna have, it's, it's based on 
democratic republic, a republic, a democratic, um, that's, what, that's what DPRK, it's what, uh, you know, the People's Republic, we're the republics there. Uh, so it's going to look way different depending on the national situation, uh, depending on what's going on in, in this country at the time. Our, ours will look a lot more progressive, for instance, than 1917 Russia or 1940, you know, 1940s China, you know, um, for certain. And I think that will look that, – that, but uh, to get to, – so socialism is the next step. It's when, the, it's when the state is run by the workers. So when you see something that they say they have some socialism, that means they have some more control. Or some state control over capital, right? One of the two things. I mean, like literally, there's two different meanings of it. One means like the state, but the state with more leverage from the work generally. You know what I mean? The state with meaning that they're the workers' representative part of the state. You know, um, but they still probably have capitalism engaging with that, especially in the Nordic bonds, or even in China right now, right? Um, especially in the '90s and stuff. Um, so, so. Communism is when you reach the form where there is where you're in post scarcity economics, uh, meaning you no longer uh, you can make you can, you have a productive capacity to build something for everyone without it costing anything. Um, so everybody can have one of everything. You know what I'm saying? And 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 then so, so basically, and so you wouldn't need money anymore. So it's, you wouldn't need class, money. You wouldn't need a state anymore. It'd be a classless, stateless society that just like worked. You know what I'm saying, but this is this is this is here. You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. This is something that, that could foreseeably happen, but it is a process that would, mm -hmm. even in the best circumstances, take a hundred years or so. You know what I mean? Um, even in the best circumstances. And so, and and guess, and I don't think that Russia, 1917, <laughs> was the best circumstances. <laughs> 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 but uh, and neither was China, you know what I'm saying? But they're but they but they did alleviate poverty in the highest amounts in human history. They did, you know, um innovation was not stifled because somebody wanted to like um hold on to something until they knew how to profit off of the most. You know, they, they told you know you, you would you would know about scientific innovation and you would try your best to engage in. And of course, mistakes are made. I mean, this isn't some sort of perfect thing with perfect people that perfectly exist it's us and we're not perfect you know what i'm saying like you know so like i mean you know and but it, but it's but it's much more determined by what's called whole process democracy at least in china um where you go to the experts you go to and everybody gets informed there's peer-to-peer -peer review of things that that, that that is actually given to the politicians and the elected officials um so that they are that who, who represent you and not a uh, corporation, you know, and, and they, so they they read this stuff and they try to make determinations based on it, not to, to deny that it even exists, you know, it's a totally different engagement. So this is a government for the workers, by the workers that eventually would lead to communism. Now, anarchists, they just want to go straight from uh, right now into communism, you know, essentially, uh, without having any sort of uh, state in between to protect us from the inevitable reaction to the revolution. Oh, wow. Okay. So what, okay. I had, I had that triggered a lot right there. That last response in a good way. Who currently, or what space currently is in the closest, um, proximity to this stage that you're referring to, which is communism. Um, is is there a society that is actually practicing um, a transition towards that? Uh, but because you say yourself, it sounds like, like anywhere in the world is far away from what you're describing, but what would be the, the geographic space that's the closest to that um, place that you're describing? And um, I guess I ask follow up questions based on what you say. So I would say um, Vietnam, Cuba, North Korea, China, Laos um, mm -hmm. are the four or the five um, Marxist nations. Um, I think that there's parts of India that are communist. I think there's parts of uh, there's parts of um, you know, Latin America and South America that have very strong socialist programs, Lula, uh, but but uh, but all of these are in transition. And another part of the purity fetish that we mentioned earlier is that um, Western 
liberals oftentimes um, will critique these countries based on a, a, an ideal of what they would hope that they would look like based on our own ideals, right? Exactly. Um, and, uh, and 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 I, my my belief is these are adults in adult nations that probably when they see something that we don't that that, that, that is that is oppressive or unjust that they probably also say I don't like that but they guess what they they have something we don't uh, agency um, <laughs> over there <laughs> and, um, and so I think that you know uh, so so I think I'll critique my own country uh, that's killed that killed four million Muslims in the last ten years more than I will, you know what I mean? And created the situations in Afghanistan that led to um, terrorism and the, the rise of uh, Wahhab, Wahhabism and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and I won't critique another nation that is under the, you know, under extreme external circumstances, like uh, pushed, you know, covered, surrounded by military bases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, or, or when they're trying to harvest their foods, they have war games going on outside their country. Or when they try to get oil, um, they they get, it gets taken by the U.S. and sold to, you know, uh, billionaires in, in Texas, which is what happened in Venezuela. Um, and uh, so I think that I think that I think that we have to look at what ha what it's like if I if there was a bully that came and kicked down my sandcastle and kept telling me I wasn't good at building sandcastles, right? You know? And um, it's 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 not it's not me that's not good at building sandcastles. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's just it's just it keeps getting crushed over and over again. So yes, there's any mistakes, but those mistakes don't necessarily uh, to me seem to be the kinds of mistakes that would lead to the kinds of negative aspects that have happened in terms of like it it doesn't seem like it's socialism. That made these states fail. It seems like it's outside intervention continuously over and over again. Uh, the, and 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 the the I would say China is probably the is probably going to achieve communism first. Um, will be the first nation to probably achieve communism. I would imagine. Um, and uh, because of the the fact that they have such a massive productive base, they have such a massive capacity, and the fact that they've done a lot of things. They get they they okay. So, uh, you're, uh, you're more likely to own a house. Than you are as an American, uh, as a 25 year old, right? Um, and so, like, uh, so, like, uh, there's, there's all sorts of things, like uh, the, the hyperspeed railway that we're going to build now. You know, they've already got that. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that are way, uh, that are already advanced in a certain way. Now, in terms of worker control, that's different. I think Cuba probably has um, the best example in terms of worker control. But in terms of actual productive ability to maybe potentially get to the level of um, post scarcity economics. Uh, that would be time. But in terms of, so I think that, and I think China prioritized um, living standards, raising living standards, whereas Cuba prioritized worker democracy, um, much more so. And, I, and and so I just think those different countries have prioritized different things. Vietnam is, is a good example of a, another um, uh, a nation. And, and, you know, they even have, you know, disagreements with China. Of course, none of these nations are, are similar. Even when we have a communist, even if we had a world where, workers ran everything, you're still going to have some um, delineations. It would just be how we would, you know, engage with that on a, on a level of brotherhood or, or, or you know, siblinghood, as opposed to, um, in, in, as opposed to, you know, this kind of competitive mindset, this imperialistic mindset, you know, colonialistic mindset. So, yeah, you talked about the, and, and I like this because people are understanding that this isn't easy and that there is, um, depending on the situation, we have to understand that they, like hierarchy is always a danger. Um, I wasn't even, I was going to ask you a question, but I'm saying to myself, it's kind of already answered itself when, because that's always a danger with any system is the potential of power um, not being the same or the, this, this whole idea of a hierarchy. Um, and I guess what I need to understand is what exactly is the state when you say the state this the state that like what is the state how is that defined is that the corporations like what exactly is the state so so for me right now the state like uh the bourgeois state okay the state has always been <laughs> this is Marx, uh the suppression of one class by another right that's what it's always been we want to eventually abolish the state yes yes that is that is the the end goal <laughs> 
Um, but to be more practical and specific, the state is the function, the, the, the people's, um, okay, so on a very, very practical level, uh, local assemblies uh, made up of people who, um, you know, ma made up of workers um, uh, are formed that then uh, vote a delegate into a regional body um, and the regional bodies have, you know, a, a, a national assembly. This is not too different from, you know, uh, uh, the Constitutional Republic, you know what I'm saying? Um, it, it's, you know, it's not, it's just that, it's just that the, you're not allowed to, in, this, in the way that like nine tenths of the media are run by um, private corporations that, that you know, uh, yeah, maybe there could be like one tenth run by, private corporations, you see what I'm saying? It would just be the, the uh, you almost, you can look at like, uh, right now we have mass incarceration, lots of people's in jails, um, and we don't want that. Yeah, I mean, rapists and pedophiles and stuff like that, you know, they need to go somewhere and be separated and be, you know, but, you know, and war criminals and, and you know, and uh, and people who have, you know, like the, the exploited people, people who have, you know, people who had a lot of power and did something really bad with it, you know, there has to be a place to be able to like, or people who try Nazis who try to kill people, you know, try, try to you know uh, start ferment you know revolutions to hurt you know working class people and stop the you know if there's a war you have to have a place to put people. So I think there is to a certain extent a time where there will still be a need for uh, inc a incarceration system, but we hope what we want it to be you know based on our own engagement with it much more kind and much more based on rehabilitation and much more based on, you know, something positive uh, to, to not based on revenge and, 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 and not based on, um, um, uh, but based on, you know, creating a situation where the state uh, has the power over the, 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 the workers have the power over their, over our land, you know what I mean? And so and that's the necessary like it's not saying we want to have the, the prison in the same offices as we have now by any means. It would be a very kinder, gentler looking thing where people got paid for the labor they did there. You know what I mean? And 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 it would be you know so and it wouldn't necessarily be it wouldn't be forever by any means. It wouldn't be like Jeff Bezos would have to stay there forever by any means, you know, or whatever. It would just be, you know, or 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 or, or Trump or Obama or something. You know what I mean? Like it would just be that they would be there for a time, understand what was going on do some regular freaking works that they never did in their life probably you know what I mean it's productive to people understand what it's like to be working class for a little while and then you know like probably yeah they, they're smart people we could probably use them if they will be down to help the working class you know what I mean we don't want to like you know and um of course there's gonna be some people fight against us and we have to do things that we don't want to do like you know skirmishes and stuff you know but that's just that's probably just naturally going to happen um so the state is going to have to continue for a while after that just to make sure that we can defend the revolution. Um, I believe that China oh, wow. already, would, would have already achieved this situation um, if it wouldn't have been for imperialism. I mean, if it wouldn't have been for imperialism stopping them, I think they would have already achieved a stateless class of society. Interesting. That, so is this, is this a pretty common um, um, I guess will most people concur that the state is necessary? Like a series, um, people who study this stuff would would there be a universal thing that the state is necessary to accomplish this? Because that's very interesting. The the thing that you're eventually trying to get rid of is necessary to get to that point of a stateless society. That's uh, to me. This is an interesting. Observation. And, and I can see, uh, so, so there's, there's the, um, I would definitely check out Lenin, Lenin's uh, left-wing communism and fatal disorder and uh, Engels on authority, um, democracy or dictatorship. Uh, these, are, these are all really good Marxist writings that kind of lay out these, these, these uh, terms essentially to a certain extent, mm. uh, because they were still dealing with the same thing because there is ideological people who we consider utopianists, we consider idealists, 
uh, not materialists, good friends, good comrades, good people who do good things, not saying anything like not trying to say they're bad people by any means. Yeah. But they believe you can go immediately from right. I, 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 will, I will give you the, the rundown because I used to be this, right? You build autonomous communities capable of defense that are connected to labor unions that are syndicated. You know what I mean? And then from there, you establish a general strike eventually. And that general strike, the next, you know, you, 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 I mean, you hope that everybody kind of replicates that model of the autonomous zones you've created. You know, and you just hope that that happens. Mm. And then you, you know, like that's, it, it kind of gets a little bit like what happens when, and we, when you start asking questions about what happens when X, what happens when this, what happens when this, and then it's like, well, hopefully all of those various anarchist groups decide that they all want to uh, evade the enemy in the exact same way. So you need centralization mm. and you need decentralization. You need both of these things. And they askew a, a centralization. We, as, I used to askew centralization uh, for magical reasons. It felt like, you know, magical reasons like centralization itself was bad or decentralization itself was bad. Both of these are important. You, know, you need to be able to do both if you want to be able to defend the revolution. Um, it, and, and so I would say that if the autonomous communities are create or you know capable of defense are all going along in a in a manner that's both able to centralize and decentralize, that that is a state. You know what I'm saying? Like you know what I'm saying? I think that I think that it's just it's just a state that's run by workers, right? Versus a state that's run by the bourgeois. And this will look so different than the state, than a government that's 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 run by corporations and allows for bribery to go on, you know, this one that that a media. I mean, the media apparatus is part of the state. The superstructure mm -hmm. is, is part of, of it. it. You know, and so I think this is, I guess I guess it does get a little bit kind of hard because it's almost like there's a structure, they call it the superstructure, which is the way that they, um, which is like the um, media apparatus, the paramilitary corporations, the, you know, all these things that exist. That, that, that control the world, material, the mechanical aspects that maintain the resource control by, for the elite, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, and this is, it's so, it is, it is really good to be talking to right-wing people um, uh, because those people, you can say, they're saying all the time, they're like, the elite, the elite, the elite. Marjorie mm -hmm. Taylor Green came so close, so close. She's like, these corporations are communists. And it's like, yeah, down with the communists, right? right, right? So like, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know what I mean though? But like, so... It, they don't they don't they're almost there they're almost there in some ways now they say a lot of bigoted crazy things right mm -hmm. but like there's but like what i mean is that the people the people the workers who are listening to this they, they see the truth in that they see where that truth is they see where when donald trump says things about ukraine and 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 and, and that we're spending billions of dollars right now privatization selling public land of ukraine to u.s capitals which is you know, that's just horrible, you know? That's like, that's the opposite of what a communist revolution would look like. You know what I'm saying? It would, that's the exact opposite. You know, it, they would be giving the, 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 the land to the people, to the workers, um, and not selling it to foreign interests, you know? Um, th they would be, you know, and, and that, that would be, this is, this is, this is too, not good for the people of Ukraine. They're using Ukrainian people as, as, a, as, a, as a proxy against Russia. As a, as a way to bolster their global hegemony and they're leading us into nuclear war. And I think that that the right wing can agree on, right? Corporate lobbyism isn't going to let your legislation that you want get passed either. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's not and so on that level, we're on this, like we're on the same page, but the question is, what do we do based on that information? What can we do? What is to be done? If you look at that, that's another Lenin article uh, another Lenin essay um what is to be done is that we have to amass the the fervor of the working class the working masses especially those who are manufacturing and shipping to be able to stop this economy demand corporate lobby as an end but and and, and to start to make legislation that we actually want but that's not you know under this current system with the people that currently are in it they will stop that from happening any way they possibly can. So we kind of have to develop something else that exists outside of it. That, but but in, in the process of developing that thing, the first goal of it is to develop that general strike, to build, to build develop that power to uh, build that leverage. And in building that power, the people who do it 
are the Vanguard Party, actually, right? That the workers who do that are the actual Vanguard Party. The people who serve them, they're the Communist Party. So, so we, we so I think this is and that's another thing people don't quite understand. It's the workers that strike, the whilst they strike, that are really the Vanguard Party. It is the communists who help them to see the framework and mechanisms by which to do it because they had free time to study those kinds of things that, that are that are that are just the, the communist part. You know, that they're part that wants to build communism eventually. But the, the workers are the vanguard. At least that's my that's my kind of uh, spin on it. <laughs> so see you mentioned a lot there and I want to frame this in a way I think everything that we've talked about has basically confirmed and solidified that context is so important and that binaries need to be avoided at all costs because mm -hmm. um, I think revolution, whatever we're trying to describe as revolution would have already been achieved. You mentioned China before. If you have different, um, I guess, angles, um, the anarchists are going to be crucial. The communists are going to be crucial. Whatever you describe yourself as, you're part of that solution. Hmm. And it needs to be sort of presented as such as opposed to teaching, I guess, people that they have to conform to something first to be a, a, part, a benefit to the revolution. Oh you have to have different con contexts within the revolution hmm. and it can't be the same collective that achieves this revolution. I think that's why diversity is so important. Mm -hmm. um, the type of mindset that you and I have, and first of all, the state, if you and I had control of the mechanisms of the state, like these social media platforms, for instance, things would be a lot different. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you were Jeff Bezos and I were e Elon Musk, and we had the mindset that we have now, things would be a lot differently. We might be dead, but <laughs> but, that, but that'd be a lot of there'd be some big big changes in the mentality. Can I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. If we were like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, how would we have developed that the the the, the, the mindset that we have now? There are real material things that happened in your life and my life that, that developed our mindset as they would now, right? The material conditions to to have the, these types of realizations of what people need is very much based on the fact that we are people who need. You know what I mean? Mm. I think it's, um, I guess, I don't know if this will answer your question. I, I think personally, it has to do with um, the disassociation of, of what personal gain means. Mm. Um, I don't know if what I would describe myself doing right now as a sacrifice. I don't see the sacrifice. I, I think if you have like what a good heart means to me may differ from somebody else. But I think that I've told a lot of people that I play basketball with. I play basketball. I'm actually going to shoot ball um, in the morning because my kids are at home because I kind of bribe my sister to let them spend the night at her house to do this podcast. But And my wife is out of town. And I know I wouldn't be able to shoot basketball if my kids were here because I'm not going to leave the house. My kids still be at home and shoot basketball. So I have a routine where I shoot basketball Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, five in the morning. Yeah. And I'm in the best shape I've ever been in my life. Just like I love just doing like sports, soccer. It used to be soccer. I haven't played soccer in like 15 years. But um, basketball is like my new sort of discovery to be like the old me. And my wife says that she sees a difference in me, like it makes me happy. And so I have like a network of people out there that I shoot basketball with. But I was telling them that I've lost a desire to gain money. Um, I think some of it is because our money really has meant less and less because, you know, once we got off the gold standard, I mean, it's really starting to show how bad, like the dollar doesn't go anywhere now um, mm -hmm. com to, compared to the way it used to. And it's very sad to see. And um, even if you believe in this capitalistic myth, you have to admit that your dollars are not going anywhere. Um, you have to work twice as hard. And for what? You're mm -hmm. working for what at this point? And it's like you're busting your ass. You're trying to provide. And it's like 
it for me it's actually been a good thing because I'm just saying to myself, if I take money away, like the incentive to make money away from things, I can I can give people the real Kiko. I don't have to worry about strings being attached. I don't have to be a Jimmy Door. Yes, I did out somebody. That <laughs> I don't think someone like a Jimmy Door who's a, who's a part of this left, this myth of what we call the left in the United States. How can that person really do the things that they want to do when you have that money incentive? I'm sorry that there is a money incentive. Mm -hmm. I can say that the information you're getting now with us, a lot of it is because I'm liberated, because I don't have a moneyed interest. Mm -hmm. Like, I can share information with people, and I don't have to worry about, like, a donor or a sponsor or anything, because whatever I say is coming from the heart. Whatever we say is coming from the heart. And we don't need, we don't care about the damn money because yeah. we have, it's basically like free association. Mm -hmm. this, this is, this is, it. this is where anarchists, I think, act like an anarchist, think like a Marxist is, is a really good <laughs> uh, maxim, right? Because, because, because technically, yes, if we all began to act under those auspices that the incentivization of money doesn't really get much for us, especially with technology with like the ability to like download movies and video games and stuff you know what i mean yeah i want to support the company but it, I, I can also just tell my like, tell 20 of my friends that i that i played it i loved it and that's like free advertising to them you know and they probably spend mm. the amount of money on them, you know what i'm saying so like i mean i want to help but like you know what i'm saying it's just it is you can engage with the world and be and be happy without money you know what i mean you can do this on a lot of levels and some and for some people it's not as easy because maybe they okay like maybe they don't know how to like if you're really socially a social butterfly and you're really good at talking to people, you can probably get a ride halfway across the country, you know, and be safe probably if you have good discretion and your mind's in the right place and all this kind of stuff. You can have this kind of straight out freedom, you know what I'm saying, to kind of just like go. But, uh, okay, like, but for those people who are at that level of engagement mentally or they have the free time, the, the, free, the privilege of free time, you know what I mean? The relative privilege of free time to be able to, to exist in a situation where somehow they're not, they don't have to engage in wage labor. Well, holy shit, that's a different class almost, mm -hmm. right? That's yeah. Almost a different class. And this is what Lenin called the professional revolutionary class, right? It's the people who have class consciousness, they get it. And then they, in the same way that like an engineering teacher could create 100 engineers, they can create more and they can do what the people can't do to like to like because they have that resource of free time they can study the, the, the dialectics of the condition they can they can reach out and, and raise awareness they can organize and, and develop you know and, and so it, it, it's that the, the that's the that's the that's the uh, space that the mechanics of of the revolution is that there will be those folks who um so that there's like what's called the front line which is the mass of the workers, um, and especially the ones who are class conscious or radical and were willing to stand up and then do something, right? And, and, and oftentimes we're trained, you know, in some way to be able to do so. Um, and then you have the periphery, which is like the press and the lawyers and like all these folks who are like, mm -hmm. who are like professional middle class generally considered nurses, some of this kind of, but they, they have a strong love for the middle class. They, these, we can see this like Fran Drescher. The activists in the in the in the, mm. in the, in the, in the action with the rock right now. You know what I'm saying? This is the periphery. This is the the flank, right? They didn't expect the rock to help them. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, uh, like, you know, just to, to talk about modern day events, you know. Um, and so, like, uh, and so then you have like then you have the 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 the, the, the most the most of people, right? That, that 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 will benefit from it, but don't realize it yet. You know what I'm saying? And, and 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 some of them sadly will join the paramilitary forces of capital and become mm. fascists. And uh, and they will try to fight against communism. They will be pushed into doing so. They will be they will be you know uh, told that that is the way in which they will give given the pseudo revolution. They will be giving a pseudo revolution of purity and cleansing the land of the degenerate that that makes it to where the the capitalists um, are able to. You know, take off the worker or whatever. I mean, like they have a million different ways of looking at it. You know what I mean? All of them are anti-capitalists, obviously. Um, but uh, but generally, the fascists do present themselves as the capitalists. And this is this is this is where it gets a little weird, right? But they call the capitalists the Jew. You know, they say the, the Jew is the capitalist. You know, essentially that that is the you know that there's some sort of mystic relationship to the Jew and the capitalist. 
that somehow uh-huh. these things, as, as if like, <laughs> as if like ancient Judaism wasn't like extremely socialist, you know what I mean? Like, you know, um, and as if rich people in every single race don't do shitty things, you know what I mean? Like, uh-huh. it's just, that's, that's how class works. So it's a weird, fascism adds a lot of mysticism into an eclecticism and, and obviously racial hatred and, 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 you know, much more dangerous things than those things um, into their, into their mix. They, 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 this is the thing. They appropriate everything, including communism. They appropriate everything because they believe they own everything. You know what I mean? So that it, it's like, it's like, a, it's like, a, you can see this in, um, and let's say somebody who knows a little bit about things, right? And then thinks that they have like this extreme understanding of everything and will not even listen to experts um, who are right there and like, and like, you know, mansplain essentially, right? And, and, and this, this is that in a political ideology, right? It's like, oh, no, this and this and this and this. And this. They'll say whatever it needs to say to get the power they need to do what they want to do, which is to, um, uh, you know, uh, create a white Aryan race or whatever. Or the, the other thing is just to make sure that we get back to liberalism and not communism, right? Like that's why that's what the oligarchs should do. Like, there could be an oligarch who's like totally like, oh, I don't like fascism, but we got to do it right now in order to stop the communists. And that's mm-hmm. literally what the Green Sox did, even if they're not thinking that way, right? Like, like back in the day. Um, and so um, the Social Democrats and stuff like that against George Luxembourg but in, in Germany, right? Um, and so, so I think that... So I think that it's 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 hard because there's a, I think that we look at ideology almost like art, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think that it's just like it's like a genre of beliefs, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I like this belief, and this belief, and this belief. Like I like this song and this song and this band and this band and this band, right? And you have the belief on your shirt, two A or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. and then you. Uh, and then, like you know, say like, oh, you got the two A, but wait, do you have the do you have the red and black, or do you got the snake? Exactly. Like, <laughs> it's like, it's so, <laughs> that's so true. Though. And so, like, that's a that's a that's a weird way to <laughs> to power. <laughs> like you're really just vaguely motion of things you like. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not a real way of. But this comes from like this is a this is liberalism, you know what I mean? This is the 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 idea that, that just having the idea in and of itself has some sort of value, <laughs> like mm-hmm. innately that like that in of itself is some sort of you know. And, and so it's, it's 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 this is I don't care why anyone calls it, you know what I'm saying? I don't care, you know what I but 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 historically, you know, scientifically nomenclature wise. Marxist Leninism seems to be a strategy that uh, that worked, you know what I mean? And, and I think it looks different in different places. It just seems like a science, you know what I mean? It's more of a science than, than, than a, these are the things I like, you know what I mean? Um, it, it's, it's more of a, and so it almost, in, in a way, it's distinct from these other things. But if CPUSA, for instance, is like the first and the, and the, and the largest, right? Um, but I mean, and I, and I definitely will, I definitely love CPUSA and I, uh, and I hope I hope people will engage and join and stuff like that. But one doesn't need to under like one doesn't have to engage with or wholesale buy into some sort of ideology or whatnot in order to engage with any of this. You know what I mean? If you really just want to engage with something, you know, start with like engaging with a bail fund near you, you know, the closest one, look at bail funds and look up which one is closer to you because you're going to be directly talking to people who've been the hurt the most by the system, right? And you're going to work with people who are Republicans, Democrats, communists, anarchists, and socialists, and even some AB people, ugh, you know what I mean? You don't want to, you know what I mean? They're not good people, you know what I'm saying? But they're, but, but, but that's, that's who, where that's, that, that is what is, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? That is what is, and it's ugly and it's dirty and it's not good. It's funky and, you know, it's not sanitized and it is, you know what I mean, and 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 and, it, and so it, it, these people, some of these folks, are not good people, right? But 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 what, what I mean is, of course, you know what I mean. There's pedophiles in there, right? Some of these folks are not, but it doesn't matter. The working class people who who are suffering in a way that we should not make people suffer, right? Because it doesn't benefit anyone. It doesn't benefit the person who was 
assaulted. It doesn't benefit the person who was abused. It doesn't benefit the person who was, you know, it doesn't, there's no benefit for them, for this person to now be being turned even worse, right? By the system itself, you know? So, so we got to look at these things in a, in a, not in some sort of like weird, like, yeah, you want to put people who did horrible, horrible things, have them accountable to it and have them put away from society in some way and have them punished in some way. Yes. And you want reparations and, 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 and uh, for the person who was harmed in that situation. Yes. Yes. But the current prison system does nothing but build profit. You know what I mean? So, the, so a, 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 a system after the revolution is going to look entirely different than that. Um, and I think that, so if you, if you were trying to get involved, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter if the, uh, the, if the people feeding homeless people are also, you know, Christian, right? Like, like if they say some stuff is Christian or whatever, okay, you know what I mean? Like, it is what it is. Just work, do, go where the people are, you know what I mean? And slowly help move them to the thing because that's the only way it's going to work. But when you need that space to like, again, this, is, this is where I was going with this earlier, way, way earlier. There needs to be a place for vulnerable for, for people where they can be vulnerable, where they can be, you know, and this is where the party is. This is where the party is, where is where it's where you go and you develop something that is, yeah, it's the people who get it already. You know what I mean? You don't have to keep, you don't have to fucking fight here. You know what I mean? It's the place where we can repeat it's the bunker. You know what I'm saying? That's our safe space. It's our <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So we're not just gonna be assaulted and sailed by the, the, the things that you know, it's not a place we need to stay. It's not a place where we need to be constantly. We just spend our whole war in the bunker. You know what I'm saying? We're not going to get any land, you know? And so, like, but we got it. But we need to go back there in order to resupply, re-engage, re you know, mm. And so, like, and so, and so I think that the, 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 the picket line, the picket line, that's the place where all of the working class can stand together. You know what I mean? And, and it didn't matter who you voted for. Right, the ballot box is fifteen minutes. The picket line is, you know what I mean. Like it can be as long as, mm -hmm. you know, and so th that's going to be a lot more important in the long run. And if we spend a lot of energy focusing on this is where this is where it does that, that, that momentum, but it's easier to just like something on Facebook. You know, of course, say, you know what I mean. It's easier just to show support to somebody. It's so easier to say, "Hey, I like these things," you know, or wherever shirt says it, or whatever. Been been, been organized in a way that's. And, and so again, you know, I think I think a lot of times people they don't have a solution, they don't have an answer. And I know why myself, I was banging my head against the wall as an anarchist, as an activist, saying, "What this this thing just did this, and the Democrats didn't even do anything that has to do with you know defund the police or whatever." You know what I mean? They didn't do anything to do with any of that. They didn't do they didn't do anything related to mass incarceration. They didn't do anything to have. Yeah. Yeah, and so, and so, so if you're if you're banging your head against the wall and you're saying, well, these spontaneous actions are never going to be enough. All like, all this money that we raised that we then bail people out with goes back to the jail, and, and, and yeah, they may have to pay four million dollars to do this thing or that thing. But and that's great, and that's great, and that's a lot of five years of work by people who are dedicated and amazing and stuff like that. And we can replicate that other places. But when you when you feel like this is a drop in the bucket, you know what I mean? Realize that. You know, there's there, there are other people doing the exact same things you are, of course. You know what I mean? And connect with them. We're, if we connect everybody, we already have it. We already have it. We already have the power. We already have the capacity. 15 million unionized workers, and there's gonna be more and more and more and more and more and more. Uh, you know, um, how many people who don't vote don't vote because they realize corporate lobbyism is messed up? And if they saw that there was a way out, they would engage. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. they, there is a revolutionary potential, it's inherent. And as more and more people understand what must be done, what could be done, what we can do, what the cheat code is, you know, um, the more, the more, uh, the quicker we're gonna have what we need. And the, the, this, is, this is where I would say that, that there's a lot of people who got engaged with hippie dropout culture, you know, uh, uh, where they don't engage with the system, libertarian, where they go off from the system, you know, and that's, you know, as an individual or personal choice, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and hopefully, you know, after revolution, whatever, yeah, you go do what you gotta do. But, but like, it, but consider that that time that you have right now, you could become a professional revolutionary. You could help 
change history. The point of history is not just to understand it, but to change it, right? And and so if we can, there's a, this is a moment. If we engage right now in developing connection, contact, network between unions and the people, between for educating, popularly educating people on these ideas and stuff like that, we have the capacity to change things, and we have the potential. It's just like I can feel it vibrating every time Cornell West speaks. You know, and and this is this. And what I mean by that is the fact that he carries with him the legacy of the Black freedom struggle, and he carries with him in him in, in, in this moment the understanding of the potential for him to galvanize this energy, right? Because he has that he has that legacy, right? And galvanize this energy that's already there to not say hey vote, but to say hey strike. You know what I mean? To say hey come together and when we come together all these organizers who get it now can go hey all right it's happening right here let's see where the people are and then we can go to them and then use that to further the thing this is this is an exciting time for revolution in my opinion the potential of it it's interesting because i was going to say i'm definitely saying that and you say the second part like damn how long we're we going to talk i know the audience is probably like she's talking about the second part of the conversation like damn this shit better be wrapping up no um, if you got another hour, I do, Jay. Um, and um, this is like, and it's not meant to be like a Rogan style, but I mean, some of these interviews um, go pretty long, and I love it because people, um, if you're in, you're either going to be engaged or you're not engaged. I mean, if you're TikTok generation and you're into like the vines and all that shit, I'm sorry. This may not be the pod for you. You have to have an attention span with this one. If you have to split that shit up after listening 15 minutes here, minute 30, the second day, do it. I've heard people say, Kiko, these pods are long. Hey, you know what? I'm not, I don't want to call my guests and audience members motherfuckers, but you know what? If you <laughs> are down with the program and you want to learn, you would sit through the shit. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not going to change my format. Some are going to be shorter, some are going to be longer. Oh, but this is too important to not, you know, we can't worry about time limitations and stuff. We have to just do our thing. But um, you mentioned Cornell West, and um, and I had a question. It's crazy the synergy we have, Jay, because you mentioned the Communist Party USA, and I was going to make a comment about CP USA. Um, uh, evaluating all these different, like, parties and everything else, I believe that the Party of Socialism and Liberation have the they have the better messaging, I think, of the left wing parties. And I say that because if I look at the CPUSA's website, which I analyzed it pretty carefully before we got on air, um I was really disappointed with the messaging. Um it doesn't seem like it's an updated site at all. And um and that's something that's really concerning because um, I looked at the site and I think 2022, maybe the earliest part of last year was the last time they had any sort of updates on the articles or anything. And so that was concerning. And another um, part of the site that I didn't like in the messaging r involves this idea of um, being against the Trump wing of the Republican Party, of the GOP, which to me is almost like if you're your own identity in your own party, why is it such uh, an anti part of the, the ruling class? It doesn't see the Democrat and the Republican together as an enemy that consists of the ruling class, but it outs and basically ostracizes a specific element within the ruling class, which is the Trump part of the ruling class. And to me, that's a danger because you have to have your own identity without deferring to like other oppositions. And to me, that's, that's basically the catch 22 with this left and this right and the categorization of things. Um, that's Tweet list and the whole time while you were off because I figured your phone had died or something. But <laughs> but basically, going um, I was given a critique of the Communist Party USA saying that to me the messaging is off. Um, I looked at the site 
And I think if anyone has the right is the party of socialism and liberation. And I'm not saying that everything they do is right, but I just think that the fact that they have the liberation school with the literature is very organized, is current and up to date. CP USA is not updated whatsoever. The site isn't. Um, the messaging is pretty much we have to stop the Trumpers and the Trump wing of the GOP. And I'm saying to myself, to me, if you're going to establish your own identity, why are you just criticizing one aspect of the electoral system? And and that's a big problem I've had. If people listen to these pods, they know that that's my biggest issue is you have to have versatility. You have to have identity, like your own unique identity. You can't be like, oh, anti this faction versus that faction. If anything, mm -hmm. the the mindset that you and I have, I don't think enough people share our mindset. So to me, those people that you're trashing are free agents of change. Like the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the people that follow her, those people are potential revolutionaries. While we're talking all this stuff about left and right, mm -hmm. I think these people like the CP USA or the people who publish that type of language and the, the lexical elements of that on their site, that's a very liberal mentality to have. And, and I think you're just sharing basically just a liberal mindset. You talked about liberalism earlier. To me, you, you're not tapping into a larger potential mm. by basically just assuming things about people who are basically using the language uh, I mean, if you want to talk about Bernie, hey, to me, those type of people are just the same variation. Uh, mm -hmm. They honestly are. And that's why a lot of the Trump people did support Bernie initially, because mm -hmm. a lot of it, honestly, if you talk about it, you can tap into the same base of people if you get the language right and if you get the, the messaging right. And yes. I think that type of, if you go to the CPUSA site, it really discourages people. And it ostracizes like so many potential people, I think, that could be a part of the movement because it's just a simple language. Because it just presupposes that one side of the ruling class is better than the other one, which is, to me, defeats the whole purpose. Because like, if you're going to be a party that's distinguished from the Republicans or Democrats, then you have to be that. You can't be saying shit like, Oh, but the Biden faction of the Democrats or the Trump faction of the GOP, to me, that just kills your whole purpose. No, I, agree. I agree with that. Um, I, I'm not, uh, so, uh, as an individual member, you know what I mean? Uh, I, I vote, I am not vote for Democrats or the, uh, or, or, you know, and, 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 and maybe local level, like, or something like that, you know what I mean? Uh, but, 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 uh, but, you know, our state level, somebody's going to, like, or pill right to work, like, have Michigan or something like that. You know, I could see that. I think what happened is another one of these things where they defer to the, what they've considered to be the popular under the popular place where people are at, right? And I think that the leadership um, deferred to where they believe the people were at. And up until I think this election cycle, people were at lesser teams, right? Mm -hmm. And I think at this point in time, people have deviated from that more so, and more and more and more and more and more. And I think you will see a change within the language soon, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, now, PSL, uh, I, I have, I think, yeah, join a party. You know what I'm saying? Join a party. You know, join a communist party. That's all I'm saying, you know. But uh, I would say that, you know, they, they, they I have a distinction uh, of, 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 of with, with them uh, that, that comes to the same point. My, my distinction would be that, that they are, uh, from my understanding, uh, more third worldist, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, which means that they think that a revolution can't start in the United States and it will have to start happen, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it, and, 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 you know, I don't know. No, no, I'm, not, I'm not scientifically. But I do think that that kind of ties into this, like what you're saying with the whole dismissing of Trump people, it is dismissive of the fact that we've already had this amazing struggle that already exists in the United States, and there's also reproletarianization happening, uh, meaning that the people who were formerly middle class are now becoming proletarian. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have a, you have a people who are who were previously, you know, being able to make it with one job, now having to work several, or having a change in the economic standards. 
there, that, that there is the potential for a revolution here. And I don't, uh, so that would be my, my, my only amber umbrage with them. You know what I mean? But again, join all of them. I don't want to say, I don't want to, you know what I mean? So, 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 so uh, uh, but if, you know, it, if you're one of those people who's like, I'm not going to join the CPU, if you were one of those folks, then the Kiko obviously isn't. But if you were one of those folks, like, I'm not going to join the CPU USA because I can't change it. I'm going to join the Democrats because I can. Well, that's not a great strategy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And see, and I'm wondering, do people feel like they have to choose something? I feel like there's always that pressure to succumb to where you have to, you have to pick something. Like, motherfucker, pick something. Because time is running out, and you have to you have to define yourself as something. You have to listen to this group versus that group. You have to always measure your options. But but is that you? Do, are you wanting to do that, or is that someone else? Like basically making you like pressuring you to do something that you really don't want to do, but you feel like that's the only option you have, and. It's just, it sounds a lot like a system that we have. And that's why I asked you that question earlier. It's almost a phrase. Capitalism is so bad that you can buy off a Western mindset. In that regards, I never thought about, about it that way, about the third world worldism. But I would say that you're, tr you're, you're right in um, coming to that observation that it would have to happen outside of the states Um I think it's just like this mindset that we have here that is um, something's just, I don't know if it's just a circumstantial thing. Um, the last um, hundred years or so, just in our political system or what it is, I don't even know if it's purely political at this point to where we have this mindset of um, where we can just convince people on a dime to just do something against their interests. Um, something as simple as like, you know, voting, you know, something that simple. Like, could this be, is, is every country like that to where there's just these massive shifts um, in consciousness um, at the last minute? Like, are they just not enough principal voters to begin with? Do other countries have that already? That's a part of their mindset. And I think it's just a trauma, personally. I think we have a political trauma. This two-party system has created a political traumatic oh, yeah. um, just cycle, just a vicious cycle of just every four years and two years, it's the same thing over and over again. Yeah, it's, it's gaslighting. And, it, it, you know, it's, it's it's keeping us from having a long historical knowledge, from having a long memory. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's, 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 you can see it in, in, in folks when they, you know, will say something that's it's a, clearly just something they heard as a talking point on the news that betrays things that they were saying three or four weeks before. Or when something that the news said doesn't come true, they don't think, oh, I'm going to hold them accountable and stop listening. They're just like, they just go along with it. Like, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's you know, the, the people, people aren't taught how to critically think, you know, um, they're not taught how to, you know, uh, in, in our schools, you know what I mean? Like, that's not, that's not, that's not what's taught, you know, to, 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 to make a part of what you're being told people don't have the, the free time to feel like that they can engage with thoughts outside of that and so a lot of times they're hearing their relatives who do care about politics just say one or two lines from fox news and that's what they get you know what i mean and um and so th this comes back to there, there is no line right and this is this is this is, so you have a son hobby you have the bread tubers you have midwestern marks you have psl you have cpusa um but cpusa and psl sadly, in a way, don't have the same direct power as Bosch. You know what I mean? And I mean that by the sense that when Bosch says something, it becomes a talking point by all the people who watch him, right? Like, it's a line. It becomes a mass line. But what, but what experience does Bosch have? What democratic centralism is happening in Bosch's space? What, what is happening organizationally that makes him be able to have this, like you said, like this kind of power, like celebrity, right? Um, I mean, like, you know, it's not obvious, certainly, a, you know, a thousand times better, but still shouldn't have that kind of, uh, ideally wouldn't have that kind of un, unelected, undetermined, you know, he, ideally his son Aubrey would be a representative from what part, part of California he's from, you know, probably, you know, um, uh, uh, because he has, because he has people who listen to, you know, if people want to vote for him, they trust him, 
You know what I'm saying? You might be a representative or something like that. Who would have that kind of say and be able to like, you know, galvanize the people and stuff like that. People felt like he's that kind of person, but he wouldn't, but it wouldn't be, and he might be a journalist. He might be, you know, something like that. You know, he might be engaging with this, but we would have a line that would be developed based on uh, what works. Like we would go and say, okay, we found out that when we told conservatives, these facts, these things worked. When we told them these facts, these didn't work. When we said it like this, this works. Not like you know, it's this many out of this many times. Like scientifically, figure this shit out. You know, this is party work, you know, and figure out like what worked for union members, what worked for coal miners. When talking about environmentalism, like find the contradictions and find out federal jobs guarantee. This is the thing that made them be willing to do this, and then replicate that. You know, but we don't have that apparatus of 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 um. Yeah, and that's what a party can and should be, right? It should be the apparatus that finds that the news is being suppressed, that finds the uh, local models that worked to do something, you know what I mean? And then finds out ways to replicate them through the material scientific application of those processes, you know? But, but, that's, why, but that's why I think we have, to, we have to find a way, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, I think this is why we have to find a way to demystify or get rid of these labels because... These labels are harming people, I believe, more so than anything. I'm not talking about Marxism necessarily. I'm talking about this left to right infighting is really something that, because honestly, if you ask me, I would say that this, the people who are describing themselves a certain way are the same people. Like to me, there is no distinction between a hardcore Bidenite and and a Trumper, like that. There's to me, there is no distinction based on my lived experience. Maybe that's different for someone else. Maybe that's different from a white liberal in the professional in the professional class that you were describing earlier. Maybe they see it completely different from me. Maybe they see the Trump people as fascists, and they see themselves as I don't know what they see themselves as. But yeah. me on the outside looking in, I don't really see a distinction. Yeah, just talk to me. The, the established literature and based on everything we said, they meet the same criteria basically. And I yeah, don't know what we're arguing, you know? Yeah, and I think that, I think that let, let, if we take this to a metaphor, you know what I'm saying? You have, um, <laughs> you have a garden, right? <laughs> and you're growing, you're going, you're going watermelon or something or, 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 or uh, because, or, or uh, fucking um, corn, right? Or, or cabbage or something, you know? And on one side, you have a line that, that says, like, blue. You know what I mean? There's the same exact fruit growing in that line. And then the other side, there's red. You know what I mean? It's got the same poisons in it. It's got the same thing. And you're like, well, I always choose the blue side. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, then, and then, like, you have all these wild fruits growing that, aren't, that haven't been poisoned, that haven't had any of the, the, the stuff in it. You know what I mean? But they don't look exactly like exactly the same. You know what I mean? Like, they're, they're, they're smaller or they might have different. Uh, you know, one of the leaves, is, you know, whatever, you know, wasn't wasn't taking, it wasn't cultivated in the same way because it didn't have the same resources to be cultivated in that same way. Meaning, like, there's not a determined the the, the the positive aspects of let's distill if we can distill for a minute. The positive aspects of having a Democrat or Republican Party are that you can have a line that you can say this is our line, and you can just, just establish that amongst your entire base. And your base will be fighting for that line and they'll have issues that they, they stand for and then they'll fight for and they'll be galvanized to engage them, right? That is the, the, the goodness of the party, you know what I'm saying? But when you have these two parties, okay, let's go back to the metaphor, right? And, and, and you have the food, it's, it's on the ground and you have all these other foods that nobody's going to engage with because they don't, they don't meet the, the, the determined look of garden or whatever, you know? Um, well, we have to, um, you know, almost get that, make people see that that garden is actually a garden. You know, that, that, that outside space actually is just ed as edible as those things inside of that, that, that garden. You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, because it's still food, right? But to do that, you know, in a way, we have to have some sort of organizational process to achieve that. Like, so that would mean, you know, 
making it, at least in some ways, have some similarity to the other thing, meaning that there's some form of delineation saying this food is okay to eat. You know what I'm saying? It's not, you know, and so that, that's a process. And so that process might end up looking like we drew the thing around the thing and then there's that, thing, you know, because because that's what people are used to looking at, you know, um, or because that's what mechanically was the best, it turns out, you know what I mean, for, mm -hmm. for the growth of the process. And, um, and we don't have that. We have a whole bunch of plants growing everywhere. We have a whole bunch of folks flotsam and hanging on to flotsam and jetsam, whereas they have a giant ship that they have, you know, two sides of that they act like are going in a different direction or something. Mm-hmm. And, and see, going into this some more, and I give the audience that, I say we got about 30 more minutes or so, just 30 to 45 minutes. But just to get some disclosure. But I was going to say, I want my audience to think about this for a second. I am, I guess I am trying to convince people of something. I just don't like bullshit. And I don't like the, um, I don't like the, I love that metaphor, by the way, the garden metaphor was awesome. I, I don't like the, um, the virtue signaling type crowd because that, that is definitely a thing, um, unfortunately. And um, everyone has their own vested interest. And I get that. But I, I challenge people to listen to the episode. I believe it's 25 with Tina Landis from the Party of Socialism, Socialism and Liberation. Um, she, she does environmental work in California. I'm not going to tell you exactly what her job is. But she deals with stuff in California. And she pretty much agreed and said, to compare a San Francisco liberal or any liberal that is in, in a big city, or they don't even have to be in a big city. Compare that to a Trumper that's anywhere in the country. And you mean to tell me based, if you're going to use these stupid comparisons based, uh, we're going to make distinctions based on who someone supports. Just think about the context of what we've been talking about before. Marxism economics, class struggle, all this stuff we're talking about. Can you honestly look in the camera and say that the people who are supposed to be the so-called left, which we know that it's bullshit that they've co-opted the left Democrats or the left party, which is absolutely absurd. If you know anything about like political structure or anything, the fact that people are able to get away with saying that the Democrats are the left-wing party and then you have ignorant, stupid ass conservatives saying that Biden is a socialist. I mean, th I mean, these are just fucking idiots. I'm sorry that people are saying stuff like that. It's just, it's, it's idiotic at this point yeah. to even say stuff like that. That Democrats are leftists and Biden is a socialist, anything like that. But people say this stuff because they just don't have the information, mm -hmm. and they're being propagandized by whatever they follow. But just analyze these people. You mean to tell me that everyone that supports Trump, that they agree that they're in that capitalistic vein? You can honestly say that. And you mean to tell me that people who support the Democrats are really practicing what they preach and that these so-called communists and socialists, that they're always supposed to be in the news? Like, it's bullshit. You compare yeah. the San Francisco liberal that's living a completely different lifestyle than a poor farmer that will vote for Trump or whatever. You tell me who's closest to what we were describing earlier. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. People need to, that, that's, 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 that's what we have. Isn't that what we have to look at? Yes. Like, yeah, if we take away all the covers and everything. 100%. And I think that that, that demystification has to happen. Uh, I don't think that, 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 that I think that there's a lot of obfuscation of what it's 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 hard because uh, there's a lot of folks who obfuscate, and this goes back to the purity fest that Carlos Carrillo talked about that that obfuscate what socialism is, um, in a way that buys in that does not help the um the people who would benefit from it most to accept it you know what i'm saying uh so so 
in the sense that they always apologized for everything that actually worked. So much so that it just re, re, it reinvigorates the idea that capitalism is the best system we've ever had. And that other than it's, it's, it's the worst system except for every other system or whatever that Winston Churchill said. You know what I'm saying? Um, and uh, so so if, 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 if they're just saying, these, well, it hasn't worked yet, but when we do it, it's going to work. Us, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like that's, that's not a great sales point. You mean the kid with the spikes on his jacket is the one who's going to do the thing finally? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's just, it's just you know, uh, it, I think that that's the, um, when you have that on one side and the other side saying that it's just authoritarian dictatorship, you know, of totalitarianism on the other side, well, you got, you've got, and then you have the, the, the liberals are doing anything, but they're being called socialist. And so you say, so, so it just, it just, it just affirms, it concretizes in your mind. that socialism is utopian, right? Because you got a lot of utopianists calling themselves socialists and you have a lot of uh, uh, right-wing opportunists uh, who are populist calling, so calling, uh, com- talking about socialism as if it is capitalism, what capitalism does, you know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and saying, and like literally saying this is the machine, this machine is socialistic, you know, that, 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 that when, you know, and so when, when we have no, absolutely no, you know, uh, hold over these terms in terms of like, you have no agency over how people understand these terms, look at these terms, we have to go back to the material, you know, the scientific. We have to go back to that and start from there. And so the only difference to me between a Trump supporter and a Biden supporter on in, in, even – and this, this is going to – you know, class is going to determine something. Race is going to de- distinguish – is going to determine some things. Uh, there's going to be things, you know what I mean? Because I'm not going to say to a woman, for instance, what reason do you have to vote for Biden over Trump? Because there's some obvious reasons. You know what I'm saying? Like there's some obvious reasons there. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm not a say to a gay person. You know what I mean? Now – materially there's not as much you know what i'm saying materially there's not as much but there is still something he's probably not gonna push pull women's rights back per se you know what i'm saying so i can't quite say to somebody like 100 that i did so i want to talk to people diff- the only difference to me though really again is how i talk to them where i start mm. you know? and that should be more individual but if i hear they're a trump supporter well i'm gonna go to anti-war that's where i'm gonna go Right. If I hear that I'm going to go to, you know, the establishment is messed up. The Democrat, I'm not, my Democrats mess the choice. If I hear they're a Democrat, I'm not going to go straight after Republicans this time, though, because they already we already agree on the Republicans. Mm-hmm. I'm go, I'm, I might start there. So, yeah, they, they suck. I'm going to but I'm going to start more where where I think liberals lie. I'm going to start more with the heart like does this thing do, do these folks are they when when they who has biden deported more people than trump did you know what i mean has he done more public land drilling than trump did you know um is the, so that's that's the, i'm gonna i'm gonna engage from a different place because i feel like if you're still voting for a republican at this point in time there's some fundamental understandings of class and history that you don't quite haven't heard about you know what i mean you haven't got the proper analysis for if you're a liberal then it's probably that you have had the chance to look at those things and you are so scared of what trump might do that you're unwilling to look at what but biden does you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and and so and so this is this is and i think this is the distinction i would say is that democrats oftentimes sadly will take what they feel like and i don't mean democrats as in the political part i mean the people who vote for will take what they feel like is the people's will like the, the you know what i'm saying they take what they feel like mm-hmm. is that thing and, and what they've been told is that thing and they will hold on to it past its point of effectiveness in terms of like uh, uh strategy you know and i don't mean to say that, that you should you shouldn't you know, have a firm line, but like, for instance, if, if right now the Democrats haven't earned our vote and they deserve of to lose. Of course not. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and they deserve to lose. They have to feel pain. They have to be held accountable in order, and, and the numbers actually are in the capacity for a third party to win. If there's a, if there is one third party candidate, it is possible for them to technically win the popular vote. 
Now, again, that will probably rig it against them. But it is possible. And that's that's something that we should that we can't let them gaslight us about. You know what I mean? And um regardless of regardless of if you feel like third party, even a third party candidate, even if you know somebody he won, you know what I'm saying? Like like I said, Cornell West won or whatever. That's still like just that's still like 0.001% towards completion. You know what I mean? Of what we're trying to do, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, but it's, but it, it would be the, the largest move forward we didn't, we'd have had, you know what I mean? To have a third party president who is in the line of Martin Luther King, uh, who's the closest to Martin Luther King that's ever probably run for president. You know what I mean? Um, or at least ever been this, this, this much attention put on them who was running for president. Cause I mean, Angela Nicole Walker ran also, I mean, We've had we've had a lot of great great people mm-hmm. for, the for the Workers World Party, with the Socialist Party USA, with Communist Party USA. I mean, well, with back in the day uh, with Eugene uh, Day. I mean, like there's there's definitely great people who've gone the past. I just mean to say, modern day, this is Cornell West is a, he's a hero. I don't agree with him on everything, but uh, he's a he's a he's a powerful powerful person that I that I I would that I, that even, that even if the situation wasn't as dire as it is, and it was a great Democrat running for office. I would still vote for Cornel West because, but but out of a personal like, I, I I've done security for him uh, uh, at one point and, and 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 just just love like as as somebody who grew up in Christian faith, um, uh, who loves jazz, you know what I mean. We have a lot of like uh, he, he talks to me in a way that mm-hmm. uh, speaks to me in a way that like it just inspires me uh, constantly. Uh, I do like to say we were talking about earlier how we both kind of you know go like you know we have like a uh, uh, um, our, our we'll go to different places with stuff. Uh, I said don't call me don't say I have ADHD that's rude I have jazz brain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Okay, I have a few questions concerning, um, I guess to clarify like within Marxism. And then we can um, finalize with um, the talk of third party candidates. I've interviewed several third party candidates. Um, so please check out the forum. Cornel West is obviously the most prominent of the third party candidates and in independents running, but there are lots of great unaffiliated and independent candidates running in different states. Um, Brittany Jones is running unaffiliated in the state of Oregon. I've interviewed Hashaki Nichols. She's located in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, she's running as unaffiliated as well. Um, I have some people who have dropped out um, since the last time we talked, but they also had um, influential runs um, in their own right as far as presidential um, race is concerned, running as independents. And um, I'm trying to think. I've interviewed Gavin, Gavin Bonney. I interviewed John Stasevich earlier. John dropped out. But um, I still want to have him back on to discuss kind of the difficulties of running as an independent, you know, for, for any office, for that matter, third party, for any public office, um, and the politics that go into that. Um, Jay, I think, kind of um, described it earlier as, you know, Basically, they work together to to ostracize any third party movements. Um, the Democrats and Republicans don't want competition. They don't want an outside force to ruin, you know, whatever party they have going on. But um, there are lots of people that I've interviewed. Um, Mike Termod is running um, as a libertarian. I think he's based in Virginia. He was actually a former police officer in Florida. But we talked a lot um, on the forum running as an independent he's running as a libertarian excuse me and i've interviewed some libertarians previously spike cohen ran um under the libertarian banner 2020 presidential race as the vice presidential candidate joe of jorgensen was running as the presidential candidate she was the um chosen one in the libertarian party for the 2020 cycle so i don't just have um necessarily leftist leaning people on the forum but the whole premise is to run is anti-establishment outside of the two-party system because a lot of people, regardless of ideology, agree that there is um, a collusion going on and that the system in place is going to always stay in place until there's some sort of an outside force, in this case, um, left-wing, right-wing, libertarian, 
anti-authoritarian um, that can somewhat disrupt this blue-red alliance that has been going on for years now with the Democrats and Republicans. It seemed like it's just a foregone conclusion that is going to be one of the two every single time. And that becomes programmed in people's minds. And so anyone that's outside of that feels like they never have a chance. And that's why, but the route is that independents are the largest block. Mm -hmm. There are more people who have an independent mindset than there are the Democrats and Republicans. So why come we can't have that mindset? <laughs> I don't know. It's just regardless of the ideology, the ideological differences that we have, um, it's one of those things that we have to struggle with. But my question for Jay, and I, I know that Jay probably wants to respond to some of that that I said, is um, what is the idea of private property in Marxism? Because um, is that referring to like, I don't own this house, by the way. For, my wife's company owns this house, for instance. So we don't pay rent at all. Um, like, what does that mean when we talk about private property within Marxism? Is that referring to like people who are working nine to five jobs that own their homes? Is that referring, what is that referring to possessions? Mm -hmm. um, personal possessions, like what does private property mean within Marxist language? So uh, under Marxism, private property refers to like factories and uh, the means of production. The means uh, of production. So, so your your home, your car, your toothbrush, your things that you acquire, um, those are yours. Those are personal uh, property possession, you know. And private property like the factory, um, uh, and the uh, the the media apparatus, uh, the uh, various things that the, that 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 benefit society and 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 are used by society are cultivated by society created by society, developed by society, but at this point in time are just controlled by a very, very few. Um, and in Marxism, under, under a Marxist uh, economic program, uh, that the those things that society collectively works on would be used for the collective benefit of society as opposed to for a few. So I'll tell you now, and I knew this going along that these figureheads, and that's the reason why this system is self-perpetuating and it continues, is because these figureheads are put in place for a reason. Um, when you, the beauty of like being an independent-minded person or a free thinker, <laughs> the beauty of being a free thinker is not for um, people to think like the free thinker, but to be able to develop your own free thought process. And you have to think of people like Marjorie Taylor Greene as part of the system. Mm -hmm. Trump is the deep state. Trump is the system. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden, Barack Obama, all these people that we've known in human history in our U.S. electorate system that have been risen from this are all part of this same system. Yes. So instead of saying that this person is less this, or less authoritarian, more authoritarian, this and that, they're all authoritative. Um, at that point, it doesn't even really matter. Like if you go to like the, the the scale that sort of measures authoritarianism and libertarianism, um, not libertarian party, but libertarianism in the sense that less oppression and more as far as um like body autonomy, for instance, would be you should have control of your body. Yeah. No one that's running the government should tell you what to do with your body and stuff. So that would be an example of being more libertarian and less authoritarian. Um, if you look at the quadrants of these people, all the ruling class are in the same quadrant. And that's yeah. not by coincidence. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Barack Obama, Joe Biden, all these people that we argue not we as in me and Jay, but in general, people who are having these shouting matches, these people, these people have the same mindset. If you break it down politically, Pete Buttigieg is the same quadrant as Donald Trump, is the same quadrant mm -hmm. as anybody that your favorite politician. Mm -hmm. uh, probably AOC now, AOC, all these people 
share the same authoritarian mindset. They just do it in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. Marjorie Taylor Greene is very aware of the language that she uses to get people wrapped into her call. Yeah. The same way that Joe Biden, as demented as he is, has a way of connecting with his liberal base that doesn't like him and they know that he's more conservative and they admit that he's more conservative, that he is a conservative, but he's associated with something that they like, the shiny object, the blue object that they want that they want to be just this great party that isn't. It's just a shit corrupted party. But he's the figurehead of that, so they have to keep supporting it because of the messaging around that illusion of the party. And um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that everything that you said and what I've said in this conversation draws me to the conclusion that whatever Marjorie Taylor LeGreen is doing as far as like her grip and bringing people into her mindset, a lot of the people on the left is doing the same thing. Like they, they're aware that they're not trying to like move us towards revolution. Mm -hmm. And that's why they use the terminology like the socialist communist in a way to sort of detract people because it's a strategy to keep people ho like honed into their movement on the right. Like it's the same, they didn't know exactly what they're doing. And Biden did this too. Yeah, I know you remember the last election. He actually, he, he weaponized socialism against Bernie and said Bernie's a socialist. So they do the exact same thing. They just find the opportune times to say it. Tucker mm -hmm. Carson, the same thing. I don't know why these people are like giving Tucker Carson all this credit because he's like anti-war and all this shit. You know, he wants to free Julian Assange. He wants to a free. He wants to free certain political prisoners. But he does things to where it's like you know he's full of shit. Like he's using language carefully mm -hmm. so he's thinking about it yeah that means yeah. he has a thought about it he he's aware of it and so he's doing it deliberately to keep people in their in their zones so so i think this this is that's, that's a very important point uh i think that we can look at this as uh remembering that, that six companies you know control most of our food supply control and and you can see the same marketing teams um you know using the same edward bernays strategies of propaganda um, the marketing and, 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 you know, psychological manipulation to get us to engage with the same, you know, the same way they do with food and the same way we do with advertisements for anything, you know, and they've learned how to create uh, the, 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 you can, you know, the pro wrestling style, like these guys are working together, but they're, um, but they're, but they're actually behind the scene, you know, but, but, but to the, the audience, you know, if you had told somebody in the seventies, uh, you know, who was like from a small town who didn't know any better, these two folks were working together, they would have not had the, even the context. He just hit him. You know what I'm saying? And the reality is he may have really just tagged that guy. You know what I'm saying? Because you can really tag a guy in pro wrestling sometimes. <laughs> and the guy might have even been like, yeah, tag me for real because we're going to write that out to the audience. And I want them to see me get bruised. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want them to think you did that. I mean, that's like, you know what I'm saying? And so, you you know, and, and we talked Carlson. I watched the Russell Brand interview, right? Um and, uh, you know, I can, I can tie this directly in, you know, they're, they're, they, he said, this is something that really, I don't know if it's been pulled out, like, in terms of analysis yet, but he said he can't think about an issue until he writes about it, which, which explains that? so much as to his debate engagement, right? It explains so much into her, dude, he's not actually being able to really wrap his mind around who he's talking to until he writes it. And he took, so at the time when he's talking to somebody, he's not being malleable. He's being stoic but when he's writing that's when he actually thinks out his thoughts he says if he can't write he can't process his thoughts that's one point it's interesting to, to 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 just as an individual right because even when he becomes a disassociated from the establishment in a certain way right when even when he becomes gets, doesn't get their money anymore he's still going to be under a certain pretense you know um mm -hmm. and, and so so um now he may change that you know a little time you know maybe 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 um, but you know, probably, pro probably not. And, and then, and then to, 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 to but the second thing he said, that really, I think ties into this conversation was he said, you can't force change too fast. People aren't ready for it. And, 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 uh, he's talking about immigration. 
He's like, I'm fine with people coming over and all this kind of stuff, but you just got to make it happen slower so it doesn't uh, shock the system, essentially, is what he's trying to say, you know? Which is, you know, it's just, it's just, he's just being, you know, racist metaphors. But, 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 reg- but, but regardless, the, the way that he said this, he said, this is where we had the Industrial Revolution. Everything happened so fast, and then you get Stalinism, and then you get Nazism, equating the two, right? As if they weren't dem- <laughs> literally opposed, um, you know? And, uh, and uh, so, so, so he he says this in this way, you know, get to, to the point about you know how they demonize social. He started saying all these things that you know he'll get in this this thing where he's like, oh, you're going in a socialist direction with this kind of talking point, and then he'll mm-hmm. demonize Stalinism in the exact same uh, moment uh, as this without any sort of context or anything other than the word. He won't say anything about mm-hmm. it other than the word, you know, and then associated with Nazism, you know. Um, and then, and they'll, and this is the weird this is an interesting thing. Nazism and, and, and Stalinism are not close to the same um, historically. And we can look at like CIA documents talking about how Stalin was a team leader. Four hundred of his eight hundred proposals, or um, two hundred of his four hundred proposals, were uh, denied in the democratic centralism. So he didn't have some sort of authoritative say any more than anybody else did. You know, he's just a team leader. Mm-hmm. Even the CIA would say these kinds of things. And so. Um, but that, that, but but to only say this to say that that is not uh, that is not how when they say the change of the proletariat, what they mean is that the working class will have final say. You know, that's a democracy is a dictatorship eventually. You know what I'm saying? Like you eventually are dictating something. Dictatorship doesn't mean one person rule. It means the that class the, in this in this context, dictatorship of proletariat, uh, which is a Marxist term, means that the, the workers. Are the ones who have a say in the political economic situation, right? And then and the capitalists don't have a say in that. The, 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 the government isn't for them. You know what I mean? They exist within it, uh, in as much as you know that they, they abide with it, um, and as much as we need them to for this time until we don't need them anymore. But they are not the ones this is government made for. And the, the, they treat us that way now. They say fascism and socialism are the same thing. We say Democrats and Republicans are the same thing, and you know what I'm saying. So that, 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 this is the this is the this is the weird you know thing they're trying to pivot, and, and, and because so many people, sadly, the revolution will not be televised. Jill Scott Heron, you know that's the funniest, one of the best songs, and uh, yes. and, uh, and 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 he and he um, three miles down is another good one, but um, but the uh, but so so he. He, you know, it's not going to. We, I think sometimes we're like, we go, we like do our thing, and then we watch. And I don't mean to say this exactly, but 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 go with me here. We do our thing, and then we wait for the system to be like, uh, to say something about it that validates it. You know what I mean? That justifies it. That we're waiting for them to say, "Hey, you did it." you beat us or something or you good mm-hmm. job you know what i mean or yeah now we finally listen to them and you know what i mean and we're always just so shocked when they say the exact opposite of what happened at an event that we were at you know what i mean or they 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 uh, you know over that you know and we and even with the, i mean this is it just continually happens this way and we expect it not to happen we expect us to like somehow hit some button some cheat code it's going to make tomorrow, the next day when we watch the news, it's all of a sudden saying pro worker stuff or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so we're looking in the wrong places for the validation that we want. And as long as we're looking to them for the validation in some way or another, we're going to continually, you know, be at their mercy. And yeah, so we, we need to look at, we need to look at ourselves for validation. We need to look at the material circumstances around us uh, to, and we need to develop programs that can give us the small wins to build the momentum we need to, to build bigger wins to replicate to, to develop something and, and that's that's a that's so much more important than who's in office yes um so i have one more question about um i think you addressed the issue of private property mm-hmm. that's the question i had about that Collectivism versus individualism, is there a perfect balance in, com- in communism? So uh, I think this is, a good, this is a great question. And, and I think that this reminds me of another thing you were saying earlier. There, there's a political compass, right? You have the libertarian left, libertarian right on the bottom. You have the uh, 
authoritarian or autocratic. Talk. When you were talking about how all the politicians are the authoritarian right, uh, and, and Hitler's in there too. And uh, oh, so, gosh. <laughs> so, so I think that I, do, I do have a I do have an uh, issue with this because libertarian to whom, authoritarian to whom, right, is a question that has to be asked, right? Um, if we're only looking at it as in uh, in a vacuum, you know what I mean? Then, then, then these these words don't really make sense. It's a democracy authoritarian against the people who didn't vote for that thing. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you, you know, so so um, is if you say no, you can't take everyone's surplus labor and then go buy a yacht whenever somebody doesn't have a house. You know, is that authoritarian? Or is it authoritarian to take everyone's surplus labor and buy a yacht when somebody doesn't have a house? You know what I'm saying? Like it's libertarian <laughs> yeah, sure. for the capitalists, it's authoritarian for the worker. And so, um, so we, we go to collectivism versus individualism, right? Um, the individual, not suppressed by the burden of um, being someone else's robot, being someone else's battery, spending their majority of their life in service of someone else who's going to get rich while their society crumbles around them you know um those are the the uh the ground the 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 soil for not healthy conditions for the individual Mm -hmm. um when the society unburdens the worker from coercive um, labor that does not give them any sort of thing they can see that benefits their life. Um, the workers who develop a hyperspeed railway, for instance, are able to use that hyperspeed railway. <clears throat> The workers who develop a library are able to use that library and benefit from it, right? You know, but um, and so in a way, when we develop these things, these things, if they're available to the worker, you know what I mean, at a, at a level, you know that that is what the rest, that's what it would look like. Not you know that that's that's more of an apt understanding of. Okay, so for let me say like this. All right, this is a good way. Uh, let's you know, if everyone was employed, you wouldn't have to work as long. Right. Um, okay. So now, it, under the current auspices, if I make a hundred hamburgers every hour and I have a hundred customers and they all buy one, and each hamburger costs a dollar, you know what I mean, uh, to, to buy, and they all cost twenty, you know, fifty cents a ship uh, or whatever, and then and then the boss takes you know uh, the other forty cents, and then you take ten cents, or and you take five cents, and the and the government takes you know uh, ten five cents or whatever, you know. Um, you know, you you've gotten five cents for the the dollar for the hundred burgers, the hundred dollars of the profits. You know, you got you get five cents times a hundred. That's like you know, uh, fifty cents or whatever. You know, or wait, five dollars or something. Like that. I don't know. Um, but you know, you got what I'm saying, right? You you not getting anything close to your mm-hmm. engagement with that at all. Now, if you remove all of those premises and you say, okay, for two hours you're working for your money, and the other two hours is going to go to society. You know, and it's going to develop to build your society. Now, maybe half of that will be for this particular local enterprise. Another half will be for a regional or a national thing that's going on, you know. Um, and, and then if you make more than we thought you were going to make, you know what I'm saying? You get you get that back um, because, you know, because you produced more and somebody else may be over here, you produce less. And if we really need it, if there's emergency time, maybe you won't get that surplus. But, you know, but, that, but it, maybe that surplus will have to be used in an emergency situation. You know, like if there's some sort of, horrible tornado going on maybe people are getting the surplus of their the, the, the more they make you know what i mean because they there's more needed you know for the society to to to, to continue so i think that, but, but under those auspices you're freed up your time is now freed up outside of work you know um to and, and your society is continually getting better and you're going to have more and more free time to the point where you know like Bunk mr fuller in the 70s is talking about one in 40 having to work like you know basically and then you know you would work maybe for three months at a time. You take the rest of the year off and do you know what you wanted to do, and and like we can develop that. And 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 
we can, you know, we can see, you know, pictures of people saying nobody wants to work anymore since 1894, you know, and what happened in the 1880s that made everybody not want to work anymore? Oh, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so um, I think we can, uh, you know, we can see that the, the, the capital system wants us to continually think that we're lazy and that we're mm -hmm. we don't deserve anything, and that anytime we, you know, you know talk to the employer talk to the talk to the boss we're really you know begging for him to, to give something of his to us as opposed to giving us what we are owed you know you 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 know if you go with your work if you go by yourself to ask a boss for a raise you can get fired if you go with an employee another employee technically you can't you can't legally get fired but the only there's no fine they just make you get rehired back pay so there's no there's no reason why the boss wouldn't fire you for doing that because, well, maybe you won't fight it. You know what I'm saying? And if they do, okay, fine. We'll give them back pay and give them a bang, you know, but uh, it's in their interest to just fire you, you know, because maybe you won't fight it. Mm. And uh, not 50% of labor union uh, um, unionization efforts have some form of uh, employee, um, Rep retribution against employees. Um, this is another way to scare us, you know, it scare us into not taking what we built, you know, what we created. And and this ties directly into reparations because black people built this country, you know, and immigrants built this country. And, and to strip immigrants of all rights and to continually, you know, redline, incarcerate, uh, Lynch and and uh, um, just 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 uh, paradise and steal and appropriate uh, culture that you know that that built the very economic foundation that we you know we we, we developed from and not ha you know it is a it is a microcosmic example of the larger worker um thing it's like we did it and you take it you know and, and it's much more direct in your slavery but it's 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 you know it's still uh, it, it, it's 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 just it's just it's just a little bit more it, it it's just a, a lesser less brutal you know less um a little bit more you know autonomy, a little bit more autonomy a little bit more you can you know you can drive to work you can have but it's 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 just it's it's a very it's a it functionally has very similar um mm -hmm. you know uh power dynamics yes um no a hundred percent definitely i um i was thinking about some other topics but I think we need to save those for another time because um, we will probably push four hours by the time we get done. So, yeah, um, I do want to ask you mentioned Cornell West earlier. You said you um, worked security for Cornell once. I'm going to try mm -hmm. to get him on the forum, um, especially, you know, starting this third season, but just some other people as well. I'm curious as to just like the field as a whole. I mean, there's prominent people, um, including you have Miriam Williamson running, you have um, Robert Kennedy Jr. running within the Democratic Party, you have um, some people running on the Republican side that are presenting themselves as anti establishment people, and then you have like a plethora of independent third party candidates. But just from your landscape and what you've been following, you mentioned Cornell West. Um, what would be pros to a Cornell West presidency and what would be some cons? Um, and I have a follow-up question to that. But um, you seem to like Cornell West. What are the positives of that and what are some of the negatives possible? So uh, I think that... Um... You know, I'm going to vote in the Democratic primary probably because I think I'm still technically registered with Democrat, even though I haven't voted for one since Obama's first term. Same um, here. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> but the uh, I I think I'll probably I think I probably will go to the primaries, and I'm probably going to vote for RFK. But uh, I have a friend who's trying to get me to vote for Marion Williamson. I like Marion. 
things. You know, I don't think she's as kooky as everybody else makes out to be. I think that's patriarchy, honestly. I think that she's got some pretty good points for the most part. But she's not she's not as good as RFK, and RFK is not as good as Cornell West, in my opinion. And uh, so the pros of a Cornell West candidate. First ever, I mean, can, I mean, uh, presidents. You're talking about candidacy or presidents? Um, I'm going to say I'm just going to say, let's just do it within the context of a candidacy, because um, I can see I can see where that's a, there's a distinction between that. I get where you're, you're going at now. Um, I just, I think people know where I stand as far as like the way the system is set up, um, as far as like the strategy of running within, you know, a certain party or running outside of a party. And how you know you have all these different stipulations in place already that benefit the two parties to begin with, but let's just say a presidency. We'll say for the purposes of this conversation, okay. one of West presidency. And then the pros would be a rapid attempt at demilitarization and and and, and the disbanding of NATO, right? Um, you don't have to worry about that nuclear football coming out. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to worry about uh, uh, if there is a workers' movement, he's not going to stop it. You know, um, if there is unrest, he's probably going to, you know, uh, um, be somebody who actually supports it. You know, which is going to be weird to have somebody in office actually supporting a demonstration movement. You know, because he's always been in them. You know what I mean? He's been, you know, right there with Antifa. Uh, so. Uh, to go to go into a little tiny bit of what happened that that I was I was there was there was an event called Amron racial realist assholes dude attacked me I've been going there for years but it was Trump's first you know it was, it was 2016 it was there was a lot of people dude attacked me I defended myself made news I was attacked at Charlottesville before that the day before that uh, um, Dr. Colonel West was speaking at a church he came he came said. I'm sitting with my girlfriend in, in, in Unity Church in, in Charlottesville, West in, in Virginia, you know, and um, I see a silhouette that I knew immediately who it was, you know what I mean? I was just like, and, you know, I didn't say anything, I just did the, you know, like kind of thing, because I'm starstruck, you know what I mean? It, you know, it is like, and uh, he comes through, and I'm like, Renee, that's Cornell West, and she's like, who's that? I was like, oh, he's like, Martin Luther King of our day, you know what I mean? I was like, he's like, he's like this, you know, just civil rights leader. He's badass too, and uh, and we got to sit down and do like a um, one of the uh, like a um, non a civil disobedience kind of like block like thing. We, we practiced some tactics and stuff. And uh, Katie Couric's security uh, when he was giving a speech came into the church right, and he had a gun in his back pocket, like in the back of his pants. And I was just security doing this thing, you know. And so I was like, oh no, so I followed at a, a distance, you know what I'm saying, and then told other security people that there's a guy a white guy with a gun in the back of his pants in the, in the downstairs area of this church you know and uh and Katie Kurt comes in and they all meet up and, I, and I'm like man you had me so scared you know he's like hey you should be doing our team or something like that you know <laughs> like you know he's just joking around but it, we had a, it was that was an intense situation and then uh, I got to hug Dr. West and so so I do have a 100 percent bias for Dr. West, let me say that. Like, there's like, there's no, I can't deny that. You know what I mean? I, I love the man, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and so I want to say that, like, that, that's going to paint a lot of what I'm saying, you know, and I can't, I can't deny that, you know? Um, now, to try to say this unbiasedly, like, okay, so the, so, so the negative things, so the negative things from a presidency would be that maybe people would, in the same way that under Trump, people sit out in the streets. You know what I mean? And uh, under Biden, they don't really, you know, as much. Um, mm -hmm. But that usually changes under a Democratic president's second term. Like they came out during Obama's second term of Occupy. You know what I'm saying? Um, so usually once once the the, the clear and present danger is out of the way, people pull the, 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 the feet to the fire the second time. You know what I'm saying? Because there's no there's no lose to doing that. You know what I mean? Because if a Democrat runs next time, they're running on the protest movements of the last Democratic president, right? Mm. Um and so, um, so I think that what you might see potentially is people like, oh, finally. And then they just get, they're like, okay, whatever. We won, you know, 
that's that's dangerous, right? We didn't win, you know what I mean? We got that. There's a lot, you know what I mean? But I think when people see their everyday life doesn't change, then there's gonna be a there's gonna be some people, some people who would who would give into defeatism and say, oh, it can't change. But if you're if if you're if you're if you're thinking out of those auspices, are you really thinking? Are you really? I don't know where you get to corn. I don't know where how you get to Cornell West if you're already under those auspices. Right. You know what because I'm saying? you're already you already don't think that electoral politics is yeah. Yeah. So I, I said I think that's like a lesser of a of a of a concern, right? Because it's not like with Obama where people were just like, oh, he's gonna actually change everything. You know what I mean? Like, um, because we really did think that, you know, I think a lot of people did, you know? And um and so I think that this is different. I think that we have a wiser uh, more experienced, more educated um, activist movement, just because of the just because of the fact that we've we've, we've developed further. You know, and we developed further in an American economic political system. We've evolved. You know, there were times when we were stifled from 1945 to I mean, 1946 or so to you know to 2001, and then and then up until like 2000. I would say until 2011, there was there was just this huge amount of propaganda uh that 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 that, that the internet you know um was able to diminish and, and with the with the with the seizure i mean it's certainly a kind of a means of media production you know that that, that people was now able to be influenced by actual people in a way that wasn't before it's just like the industrial revolution i mean it's a big thing that happened it changed things in terms of information you know I mean, it's, 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 it, it opened up the floodgates in both positive and negative ways. And so I think that we should capitalize on any, any, anything that happens that galvanizes the people, you know, where the people are and be there to help move. And, 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 and that means even in the, even in the right wing spaces to a certain extent, not to say that everyone needs to be doing that or whatever, but people who feel like they have the capacity to talk to right wing people uh, in, a, in, a, in a in a way that m- moves their moves them forward, you know, get in those spaces. You feel like that's a beneficial thing that you really feel like you can maneuver people from that to a place where they're actually fighting for workers' rights and stuff like that. And you're not going to have your energies capitulated by whatever uh, form is being taken in that space, um, you know, uh, for hatred or bigotry or corporate capitulation or you know whatever. Um, you know, whatever space, whatever space exists, you know what I'm saying? Uh, whether it's a, you know, back in the day, you know, they used to hang out at bars after work shifts because it, it work, get, get home, you would oftentimes pass through the bars. And that's where a lot of the coffee shops and bars are where a lot of revolutions took place. But we don't engage the same way anymore because right now, first of all, people can, you know, couldn't read back then. And, 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 and now, not a lot of people couldn't read, but and now people can, but they're so fucking over inundated on the internet with all this stuff. They don't want to talk about it when they go to a bar or coffee shop to relax. That's the last thing they want to talk about oftentimes, sadly. You know, and when they do, they're just wanna they just want to have their opinions reaffirmed, you know? Mm-hmm. But you can break through that. You can. Um, if you if you if you don't take it personally when you disagree with them, you know what I mean? If you go, okay, wait a minute. This is this is this is hard. I think this is kind of where it's it's like like I was saying earlier with the addiction thing, you don't want to have to, you're not, you don't, if someone's just not quit drinking, right? You don't, there, there's nothing inherently less valuable about the person who is, who is an alcoholic and is, you know, acting alcoholic, but the person who is an alcoholic who's no longer acting, maybe doesn't need to be around that person while they're drinking. You know what I'm saying? Because, and in the same way, White people, white poor working class people didn't develop, right? Didn't develop racist propaganda. You know what I mean? They they did not have you know they they just they just are conditioned with it, you know, um, not innately by any means, but just through historically, you know, and so you know it, 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 it's interesting. There's a contradiction here because the most effective person at ending racism within an individual white working class person would probably be a person of color because th- that's how. You know, they they have more experience. They have more engagement with the the thing. Would probably be, and if you can if you can come friends with somebody 
and you start to empathize with them and empathize and see and stuff like that, mm-hmm. then you know, more likely you are to, but it's more dangerous for that person if this person is under some sort of like, you know, bigoted notions, right? So it's kind of a, you know what I'm saying? So it's almost white people's place to kind of be like, hey, we're going to you weaponize our privilege in this moment. You know, we're going to we're going to step in and 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 take that space to call in our own who you know in terms of race uh, who are under false notions, right? Um, but I don't know if it's I don't know if it's I, I would almost assume it would be more effective for people of color, but it would be less it would be less safe, right? So you know what I'm saying because and so it's so it's a it's 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 hard right there because like it's like if you create a group of people to go do this thing as a tactic, you know, um, and, you know, it's, it's all about engagement and participation, you know what I'm saying? And so if you have a bunch of, but, but you, you, you would almost have to have, like, I feel like a, a, this is just a tactical thing, right? It would be really, really good to have advisement um, on any given, you know, like, like an advisement and a, like, let's say for instance, you have a, a, a black council within a union, right? Um, okay, and, and uh, like having uh, two members who were not 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 voting members, but were there to take back to the to the non-black members what the white members had, what, the, what the black members had said, and somebody to offer what the white members are saying that that kind of like, hey, this is this is what people where they're at on this thing, so that you can bring the response back to the people. Not saying the white people have some sort of effect in that specific space, but that they can be let known what uh how they can better support it right and and so you're getting this kind of i think in that situation um this so so in the same way if you're fighting against racist in a a very general situation if there's people who don't feel safe doing it you know in for whatever reason um if you're if you're fighting against racism in terms of just talking to people you know not necessarily security or whatever um that 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 it's that that it's going to be it's going to be weird if it's just a group of white people. You know what I'm saying? Because you're creating a, a white only space in a way. You see what I'm saying? If you if you act under the auspices that only white people can do this because it's only safe for, you, so it's, that's that's that that has become something I've seen in the anti-fascist movement is where it's like in the in white racism you've created a white only space. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Mm. It's like because you're afraid that black people won't be able to handle themselves in that situation or something or whatever. You know, and, and that's like a real. You know, it's paternalistic in a way, you know? Uh-huh. Um, so, so it's, so it's not saying that all, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of awesome black anti-fascists, a lot of awesome people of color who are anti-fascists, you know? Um, but, but just saying there are some spaces where it's like, where it's like, and so that, that's a danger is that, is that, is that, is that when you sit, when it, whenever, I, whenever people say like, it is white people's responsibility to talk to the white people. Yeah, 100%, 100% it is. But that doesn't mean that, you shouldn't 100% have, at the very least, advisement and mentorship from black on those talking points. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. uh, and, and on that, and and and, the, and that technically, tactically, it probably would. I don't know. This is this is just a thought. It probably would be better if it probably would be more effective. Let's say not better because I don't want to make a moral judgment. It probably would be more, more effective um, if it, if it did come from the person who actually had experienced situation versus somebody who is just conjecturing based on I think that's um and this is I think this has become a gradual development within my own psyche I don't I understand the the um, use of, of people of color but I also have significant issues with it because um I'm just starting to, I'm still trying to grasp within the idea of capitalism that we're suffering under right now. Um, I'm still having issues connecting the dots because because for me, personally, being a Black person, it's pretty clear that there can't be any sort of like mistake that I'm a Black person just visually. If we're basing it, if we're basing Like, what exactly is this stuff being defined as? Is it defined based on optics or is is it defined based on experience? Because I just, um, 
people of color concerns me to first of all it is too ambiguous yes um and i think it's become used as a political ploy and it definitely creates a lot of issues within black so-called black communities and other communities um and, and to me it's like it, it would make more sense to describe it as a human community and i know yeah. that this sounds very cliche but at some point, where does that just go back to just the human community? Because um, who are these people of color? Because when you say that to certain groups of black people, and honestly, myself included, and I hate being lumped in with group thinking stuff, but I can't say that the, the people of color thing has definitely started to bother me more and more over the years. Mm -hmm. Because some of us cannot escape it as easily as other ones. And then and then it becomes like, who are these actual people of color? Just on a visual, not even we're not even talking about life experience, because that would presuppose that people of color oh, have so well. these distinct life experiences to begin with, which I know plenty of motherfuckers that don't have those um descript and even myself to a certain extent. I have not had the same types of struggles as a lot of people that even grew up in my neighborhood. Yeah. Um, just just based on a class perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, it's just it, that can is it's kind of hard for me because I think it's because I can't define it. That's what makes it hard for me to kind of grasp with. So I think uh, monopolization by liberals is, is such a it's such a dangerous thing. You know what I mean? Mono uh, to, to say, yeah, uh, 19, uh, 2042, white people won't be the majority. What the fuck are you talking about? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that kills me. That like, kills me so much when I hear like, like what does that even mean? Like, like go like a, Harry Condor tells this great joke. He says, if you think that it's just like some unified team. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like go to a, like a, a gas station that's like run by Korean people with your black friend and see if that's the case. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> it, it is not like, you know, and I think that this is, this is okay. I think that the term, the term when, when, when I try to only use the term when I am referring to something where I, 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 I try to say black people and people of color, or, or, or people of color in that kind of situation. And only in the sense where I'm talking about very specific race issues where I'm basically saying not white people, but I don't wanna make white people the default normative, right? Because it's not in, in worldwide, you know what I mean? And, um, and, and I just say that in the sense of, there are some ex things that white people don't experience and it, not people, all people of color experience either, but are like in a situation where like in this particular situation, um, if a person of color is able to get the same rhetoric across to, if, if somebody who's not white is able to get rhetoric across to a bigoted person, that's probably going to be more materially useful um, uh, for that for the for the, that person's education because now they also have somebody who's in the community mm -hmm. they can learn from. You know what I mean? Uh, versus if they get it from a white person, so I would I would only use it in very very specific situations. Mm -hmm. Um, where I'm not monopolizing an entire group of people who have such different, extremely diverse, you know, uh, engagement. And, and, and see, that's, I appreciate it, that um, distinction because it, it almost comes across as gospel otherwise. And, mm -hmm. um, and, that's, and that's the stuff that kind of, it, it really gets under my skin because um, it does sound very much like a, like a, like they've, is a paternalistic type. I don't know what it is. Is that? Is very much as a domineering type of. Um, it's like you said. It's like you said. White becomes the default. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. isn't that supposed to be like, if we're if we're going to stress like the human element, aren't we? Shouldn't we try to get away from that whole idea of white, 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 white? All mm -hmm. this. It's like we're in this together, you know what I'm saying? It's like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what the history was. It's like it's like look at where we are now. It's like we're going to determine with our creative minds now, like where we're going in the future, a hundred years from now. We can't keep using the same playbook. Mm, and that's at very some point it has to. At some point, it has to like something has to change, you yeah. know. And and this is a tough 
discussion too because I know recently, based on the affirmative action case, there's a lot of disagreement on that. Me personally, it doesn't affect me the same way only because I think I dis I, I sort of disassociated that whole idea at that point. I think we've kind of touched on it some earlier. It, it, it basically comes down to do you think that we've reached the point to where we can grow as a community versus are the inequities just so much to the point where we can't have the conversations? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I think at this point that history has kind of been established and we're going to have to build our own history now and we can't just keep going back to the past to like um, find these different and I think that front of action thing, it, it kind of goes back to we're revisiting the civil rights era all over again. And it's like, is that how much is that going to benefit us going forward? You know, because mm -hmm. I think that the bit I think that that period had its purpose. And I think we benefited immensely from it. I think mm -hmm. we wouldn't even be having these conversations if we didn't have any progress. Oh, so 100. I, I think for people to say that we haven't progressed as a culture, that's just a lie. I'm sorry. We yes. want to have these conversations like this. That's a testament to racial uh, progress. That's right. a testament to all of, all of this. So to say that, I think affirmative action has um, done great things, but has it outlived the purpose? I don't know. And I'm not going to fault people for having a difference of opinion of mine. I think in some ways it has kind of outlived the purpose um, for the reasons I gave earlier about the class dynamic mm -hmm. with um, certain types of black people that I see all the time sort of um, like, sure, we're all black, but it's like they're in a completely different class and the way that they talk, the mindset, it's, all, it's almost like in New Orleans back in the day where the mulattoes were basically a higher echelon the brown bag test. If you were lighter than the brown bag, you had certain advantages. Sure, you were black, but you were a different class of people. And so I think now it's like, are we going to keep talking about affirmative action um, in these essentialistic terms, or are we actually mm -hmm. going to try to get something tangible from it? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's where I kind of struggle with it, you know? It's like, I, I guess that's where I'm at with it, and I don't want, it's not to discourage people to like, um, discredit their like concerns about the decision, but it's just like at some point it's like we got to say, okay, what's the context of this? Mm -hmm. I, th I think uh, you know Zach Hyden had a really he, he had a really good take on that. He was like basically you know they could have expanded uh, affirmative action to talk about everyone who's under a certain poverty line. You know what I mean? That could have made it where everybody would have supported affirmative action. You know what I mean? And that would have helped everybody. You know, instead they cut off people who probably are in a different class situation than other people. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and you're probably accurate that probably, you're definitely right. You're 100% right that the progress we've made is oftentimes on the left. Oh, this is this is a sad, sad situation. This is another one of the purity fetish. In other countries, they're allowed to use their historical narrative and their historical situation and be proud of the fact that they came out of a bad situation and came into another one. When we do that, that's racist somehow. Like, no, mm -hmm. it's not. Like, it's like, literally, what are you talking about? As, it, as it, you're, you're erasing the uh, power that black people were able to exert, that people, that, 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 that all sorts of activists and workers were able to exert and saying that all that didn't mean anything and that we shouldn't be proud of it. Otherwise we're being patriotic and patriotic, patriotic and racist. Now I can love Harriet Tubman and say that she was a great American and I want to be an American like Paul Rose. I want to be an American like, you know, um, like, like Colonel West, like, you know what I mean? I want to be an American like those folks, you know, and that's what Colonel West is the best of America. And yeah, you can get an ultra nationalism and nationalism if you go way too far and you add some racist elements to it, certainly. But if you derail those race elements, look at the actual historical context of the progress that we've made and, and, the, and the beautiful, amazing progress that we've made. And, and you look at the Rainbow Coalition and, and, and things that were, you know, that, that we can see that like, yeah, we're going to have to come together as workers and start identifying as workers. You know what I mean? Because our experiences are going to be so diverse because you have this one kid who really loves anime and has grown up learning Japanese 
and he lives in like Philadelphia or something. You know what I mean? And you have like, and you have this other kid who like really likes hardcore metal from Sweden. You know what I mean? And like, and, and, you know, and he lives in like the Bronx or something, you know, like, and, and he doesn't, it, that, that's like, it's like, so like that, like that's so different, like individually, culturally, uh, but they could be, you know, one of them could be uh, uh, from Mexico originally, and one of them could be from Philadelphia originally, you know what I'm saying? And, and be a black person. Like, and they could be, you know, and, and then there's other person, you know, they could have more in common with somebody who's living in uh, South Korea, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and just happens to, you know, because of their in, in just genre wise and their worldview and their thoughts, you know what I'm saying? Other than the material circumstances that engage with them up until the point of engaging with the internet, which the internet is digital space has created a whole new way of engaging with things that we don't mm-hmm. even have the, the comprehension of yet. So I, I, I do think that it's, it's hard because I know, and this could be, this could, this, this could tie into white guilt. This could tie into a lot of things, right? Where you hear something, you hear somebody say, why isn't anybody talking about this thing that affects black people? And you're like, like affirmative action. And you know, I haven't heard people on the left saying the amount of affirmative action. I keep hearing that. And, and immediately I'm like, ooh, I should look more into this and go, and like, oh, there's a deep, like, man, it's really fucked for black people in this country. And I love black people. I love, you know, I, 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 love, I love, you know, you know, like my black friends and I love my, you know, like, and I love the, the, the history, the amazing, you know, so I want to, as an empathetic individual, you know, and sometimes that can be, we got to realize that there are times when that can be used against the black, the, the, against us and against working people. It can be. There's no taboo for what they'll use against us. Mm-hmm. They'll put a rainbow flag on Raytheon, you know, like, oh, yeah. And, th- and that is, that they will say that Thailand is less LGBT friendly because they don't have rainbow flags. And like, it's like, like, wait a minute. You know, they didn't have, they didn't have to have pride because they were never attacking the same way gay people are in America. You know, they didn't have the right religious right raining down on them. You know what I mean? They were never not allowed to be trans. It's, just, never- it's a completely different culture anyway. Like, yeah. it's just, and, and, but you see that you hear that kind of stuff all the time. Um, which is just, and I think that's the Western danger, like that Western mindset. Um, is it's like the West cannot get outside of itself. It has to be within the context of the West. Mm. Um, and I honestly, and people may disagree with this. I believe that's where I, I call it honestly Russophobia. Um. Mm. And, and it's not to defend Vladimir Putin, but oh, the Islam, yeah. I believe that Russia, part of the the ambiguity towards Russia and the hate towards Russia now, especially in the mainstream media, this happened way before this invasion. Um, a lot of it is based on the inability to define where Russia is geographically. <laughs> it cannot be defined, really. It's an enigma. It's Eurasia, um, yeah. It really spans more Asia than anything, and it's obviously to me it's clear that it's not European, or or it's not European enough. Yeah. Clearly, just based on mm. these status narratives and just everyone else talking about it, Russia cannot be pigeonholed the same way that France or any of these other G seven countries can be. You know, kind of put into well, we know that this NATO, this is NATO. We know that this is perfectly in this box, but how do we define Latin America? Is Latin America part of the West? Is Africa part of the West? Is Russia? It it seems like the global South is always put on another pedestal Mm. because it's undefined. Mm, mm. And BRICS is changing this. BRICS is getting getting people national sovereignty in a way that allows for the suppression of Marxism not to be as heavy for the bolstering of fascism not to be as heavy and for self-determination to be much more likely uh, an affinity of brotherhood or siblinghood that, 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 that spans beyond um, um, uh, some sort of extractive form uh, that, that, that goes into, let's actually develop better for each other. And this, 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 um, this global hegemon won't be able to affect our, our engagement anymore. Um, there is there is such a um, there is such a, a way of 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 of, of a, it is it is it is so. I, I'm glad that we that we 
as an, as a nation evolved as a movement evolved in the way that we did that we went through identity politics so we could understand power dynamics you know what i mean like so we can understand how it works because now we can look at china and say okay whatever's happening with the Uyghur situation whatever's happening america killed eight million muslims or, or iraqis i'm sorry um and, and and four million muslims we know over the last 10 years right and we created the situation in Afghanistan that led to the beheading of 100 people in uh, uh, in China. Uh, the, the, and, the, that, and, and they responded by re-education, by some arrests, but, but, but they actually, but the, the, those folks have more rights than our native people do here in the United States. And yet we will say, when we're killing, when we're bombing people, but their response of re-education is a genocide. What? You know what I mean? Like, where? When's the last time you saw a Native American a book in the Native American language in a book? Well, you can go to that province in, 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 in there, and you can find Henry Kissinger. You can find Marx, all written in the Uyghur language. And and so, like, this is to, you can't compare. You compare the two, and you take one out of you, you can't. It is it's just so much more, so much worse, and so much more. Uh, you know, uh, and, and and this 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 comes down to you know we're going to criticize this group. While we're doing this thing and say, oh, they're both bad. Like, you know what I mean? But we're not able to, but then when we look at Democrats and Republicans, well, you know, what? well, one's better. You know what I mean? It's like, like about, and we, those margins are not the same. If one Democrat president did, did, did what China was able to do over the last 20 years, or, you know, if, if the Democratic establishment, we would not be, we would not be voting for anybody other than Democrats. You know what I'm saying? We would not, we would, yes, we have 90% vote turnout, we'd all vote for Democrats. You know what I mean? Because they would actually be doing what the old you know, people was. Exactly. And, yeah. 100%. That's, that's a perfect way to look at it. Um, I tell you, I want to keep going, but it's like, I also want to save things for a later time because I know there's going to be a lot of questions and discussion generated from this uh, conversation. Um, like I said, I think we're well. Uh, four hours into this, I think we're we're at the fourth hour, and I think we're gonna stop it here. But um, I want to say, Jay, I appreciate you joining me tonight. Um, I gotta shoot basketball in the morning. I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> and I'm, I'm gonna give me something to eat too. But I want my audience to know where we can reach you, um, in case audience members did have a question or um comment. I'm exclusively on X. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So uh, you can find me on Facebook, Jay Carico, um, J E C A R I C O. Um, I'm on Threads. I think I'm JX. No one on there. Um, uh, um, often in the YouTube comments of Midwestern Marks and on Discord there. Um, uh, I'm going to be uh, writing for a publication here soon. I don't want to say it out uh, yet because it's not it's not published yet or anything. But um, but uh, I will be. Uh, you can you can reach out to me via email if you really want to. Uh, J M C A R I C O at gmail dot com. Um, I'm always interested in uh, helping folks with uh, if they want help if they want unionize or if they want if they want if they have any sort of mutual aid things. I'll signal boost those those for you. Um, I have a pretty wide network, um, and uh, and then I guess um, I'm on Steam also. Uh, and if you reach out to me, I'll give you that information. Uh, and I love playing video games, and I like making music. If you want to hear our music, uh, Sound Bandits, uh, Bandcamp, uh, Sound Bandits One. Um, I'm on YouTube, JX No One. Uh, I think those are the those are pretty much it. Yeah, I was going to ask you about. Do you have a YouTube, and do you have a Twitter? I do have an X or Twitter or whatever, um, but I don't. I think it's uh, Indie Clocks at Indie Clocks or yeah, Indie Clocks. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. But anyway, yeah, I'll definitely link your information in the description. And um, guys, there's just so much more um, that I want to ask the audience and also like engage you and the audience both with this um, discussion. But we'll stop it here. And like I said, I'm sure that this is going to generate a lot of um, um, headwinds going forward. But I appreciate you, uh, Jay Carrico, 
joining a third time on Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. This has been a wonderful episode 51 and the debut episode of season three um, of the podcast and the YouTube platform. Again, inform your interested friends and family and tell everyone to subscribe to us on our official YouTube channel and your favorite podcast and platform. Anything else you want to say, Jay? I think that uh, one more that we'll own, uh, there's a GoFundMe for my friend Jamar. Jamar is uh, a, a musician and a, a farmer. Um, he is a um, an activist and he's a wonderful human being. Um, he is currently needing a lung transplant. He's raised two thousand five hundred dollars so far, um, four hundred of which came from the Sunrise Club here locally. Um, and he had black mold in his apartment, um, and uh, that exacerbated COVID that he got. Um, mm -hmm recently and and, and uh so it's a it's a terrible situation he's in the icu at um park ridge in chattanooga um right now and so um if anybody can help out uh he's he, he just, you know he's he's get to, he's on the transplant list he's three weeks out if he can make it and uh or just you know uh, praying or hoping or whatever it is you know uh that that, that he's able to um the doctors are able to uh tune to him in a way that's you know beneficial and that he's able to um uh uh take this and, and and keep on fighting and um he's a wonderful person and if you're able to do anything with uh, to, to 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 help out um he he could really use it yes thank you for that shout out when you posted it yeah i shared it i'll also share it again and get your word out on jamar um What's what's Jamar's last name? Oh, um, he goes by the street pharmacist, and his last name. Uh, I'll go. Name. Yeah, I'll go. Um, because that was like a family member that started to go fund me, right? Yes, yes. I think they share the same last name. I just I've always known as Jamar the street pharmacist. You know, on Instagram. Okay. We used to be in the Appalachian Panther Party together. We've been on, we've done some events together. He's a wonderful dude. Um, okay. I'll definitely make sure to include that in the episode description as well. Um, there's a lot we didn't get to talk about. Um, I want to talk about workers' dignity, which is um, a really important um, source of um, labor movement in Nashville, Tennessee. But um, we didn't get to that. There's been a lot of stuff that happened with them um, this summer, a lot of crazy stuff. Um, but regardless, we'll leave it here. And uh, we will talk soon, beautiful people. We'll talk very soon. I don't even think I use beautiful people today, um, but beautiful people have a great night and we will talk soon. Cheers.